Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ruth Mandel, director of the Eagleton Institute. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. And I don't think uh, we're far enough into January, or too far into January, that I can't say Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, all good wishes for uh, what is going to be, I think, for everyone in this room, certainly, a very interesting year ahead in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, we are here to talk about New Jersey and uh, how whatever is interesting in the state uh, gets communicated to as many people as possible. And I want to begin, it is my role just to welcome you and then I'll turn the program over to the people who've organized it and who uh, are going to be running the sessions. But I do want to begin by acknowledging um, Ingrid Reed, who is uh, a former member of the Eagleton staff. She retired a long time ago, but Ingrid will never retire, as everybody in this room knows, <laughs> and uh, has more programs and projects and activities uh, that are useful to the state and very impressive from the point of view of Eagleton. And so I know Ingrid's been behind putting this session together, and I know you all join me in acknowledging and thanking her for bringing us together today and for whatever constructive results we can hope for out of this conversation and beyond. Um, we here at Eagleton, um, as you do in the work that you do, are uh, concerned with it's a university. We do research, we gather information, we try to educate students, and we work our best to get the information out there and, and some knowledge as well. Um, it's an old building, but we try to use some of the new ways to share information that are becoming more and more available to us. And while we love this old building and cherish it and appreciate everything that happens in this room with the help of the atmosphere that's created here, um, like everyone here, we're trying to keep our resources cutting edge. I don't know how familiar you are. I hope some of you have picked up uh, our annual report. If you're not familiar with the Institute, because we like, we'd like to have you know more about it and come back uh, on other occasions. Uh, but in some of the work that we do, we have really moved out of the drawing room, uh, partly through the camera, which we only, I think it's only about how long, Ben, that we've been filming most sessions, a year or two now. Uh, partly through the camera, partly, of course, uh, in whatever way we can uh, through social media and cyberspace to try to do our work in a broader, in a broader world, broader atmosphere. Um, in particular, among the programs here, some of you may be familiar with the Center for American Women on Politics has an incredibly active website um, that is nationally not only recognized, but it's used on a daily basis here in New Jersey and beyond. Um, that is a terrific resource for journalists and, of course, students and teachers all across the country and organizers. Um, also, uh, the Eagleton Poll, I think you're familiar with the Rutgers Eagleton Poll. That goes out of this room, way beyond this room. Um, it doesn't happen if it's not happening out there so that the governor can make a few comments about it and, um, and other people can find uh, uses for it. The, uh, the most recent program we've spent a good amount of time developing in the last couple of years, and we're still at an early stage, but we're very proud of what we've done so far, is called the Center on the American Governor. Um, which is, uh, and I invite you all to take a look at it at some point. I think you'll find it of interest in some cases to the work that you do. Um, but it's a resource uh, that is heavily focused in its early stages on the state of New Jersey, but it is also national. So we are promoting research, information gathering, archival collection, conversations videoed, um, interviews with cabinet members about the governor the state executive in the United States with, as I say, heavy emphasis on New Jersey. So we've got a wonderful early section on, on New Jersey with Governor Byrne, Governor Kane, Governor Whitman, Governor Florio, and we're moving forward. Um, and uh, that is a program that really began as 
a conversation inside this building that never has never intended to be anything but a way out into the world through the web. So it's a virtual center that we're trying to develop that people all over the country can tune into and use. So that's just to give you a sense of where we're trying um, our best to share what we do with the world, and we run into the same challenges as everybody else. It's an ongoing challenge for us uh, and how to keep um, getting better at getting out what we have. Uh, I, uh, I know that's in a broad and general sense going to be part of what you're talking about. And I look forward to uh, listening. Um, and most of all, personally, I want you to solve the problem of public media in New Jersey. And <laughs> it's, I can't think if, you know, if, if there were ever a group of people organized together in one room at one time to do that, this is it. Um, so you've got to make uh, you've got to make great headway today, and I look forward to being um, a part of the audience. So again, welcome to Eagleton, and enjoy the afternoon. We hope you all come back, and uh, we will, for posterity, make sure that uh, we have available what it is you say to each other today. I now turn it over to the people who've really organized this program, and that's going to be Ellen Goodman <laughs> to begin. Thank you, Ruth. Just over a year ago, we held a similar forum um, to this one at Rutgers Camden. And by we, I mean uh, my institute, Ripple, Ingrid Reed, who is her own institution, um, uh, David Haas and the Wincote Foundation, um, the Community Fund for New Jersey. Um, this was some months after the state of New Jersey had transferred control of its public TV and radio stations to the public media nonprofits based in New York and Philadelphia who are here today. At that point, we asked questions about how we should assess uh, and how they should satisfy the information needs of New Jerseyans in a rapidly changing media environment. Now, a year later, the station operators, WHYY in Philadelphia, WNYC, and WNET, I know that it's actually subsidiaries of those organizations, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll use those acronyms in New York, um, have had a chance to roll out service over the radio and TV stations formerly owned by NJN. We've passed through a federal election and Superstorm Sandy, as well as many crises in New Jersey politics and policy. The national media trends that we noted last year have all intensified. These include greater emphasis on local news and information, greater use of social networks and news provision, in news provision, more varied partnerships and collaborations, and more intensive resource constraints and business model experimentation. So we join together today to look at the data gathered over the past year on how New Jersey news and information providers are doing and to hear from the successor organizations to NJN to discuss their visions for the future. We are largely focused on public media, meaning the digital and broadcast operations of the state's public broadcasters. We also acknowledge that public media includes a broader array of nonprofit and sometimes commercial entities working in partnership with broadcasters to satisfy the news needs of the state. So we thank, um, again, the Wincote Foundation and David Haas, um, the Community Foundation for New Jersey for their support, as well, um, of course, the Eagle, uh, Eagleton Institute um, for hosting this event in this beautiful space. Before we get to our first panel, um, let me just begin with a brief summary of the status changes to New Jersey public broadcasting, just so we're all on the same page that brought us to, to where we are today. Public broadcasting got underway in New Jersey in the late 70s, um, which was somewhat later than it took off in other uh, parts of the country. Um, what also set New Jersey apart was its decision to launch public broadcasting under state control, as opposed to relying on privately owned nonprofit entities. Over the years, the New Jersey model came under heavy criticism. NJN, the, state, the for, former state network, um, earned praise for its nightly news report, uh, which was unusual in public broadcasting in those days and still is unusual. Uh, but viewership was low, station membership was low, and critics thought state control over the stations hindered innovation and growth. Moreover, the state never developed its radio network. 
The nine radio stations were weak and outside of population centers, uh, with the exception of the Trenton station. Only about one-fifth of the state's population is actually within range of the stations. Uh, and on top of this, NJN did not develop radio programming um, and instead merely rebroadcast its TV programming. State funding steadily declined through the aughts, and in 2010, New Jersey state law authorized the sale and or lease of the state's nine public radio stations and four public TV stations. And in July 2011, after an RFP process, uh, WHYY emerged as the buyer of the radio stations in the southern parts, part of the state, and WNYC as the buyer of the North Jersey stations. And WNET won the right to operate the TV stations. So according to the law, um, all of these stations are supposed to be operated with three goals in mind. One, the provision of New Jersey-centric content, uh, statewide coverage, and three, the provision of civic journalism across new media platforms. Um, I guess one other point that's worth making, um, technical point, is that on the TV side, the stations are still owned by the state, although operated by WNET. And on the radio side, the stations were bought outright. Our plan today is to start with some new research in our first panel on the state of New Jersey news and information, including public opinion polling about how the public perceives TV and radio service in New Jersey, uh, and a content analysis of New Jersey-oriented TV news. We will then move in our second panel um, to uh, uh, discussion among public TV and radio operators and uh, hear from them about their current operations and plans with respect to New Jersey service. Our final panel, our third panel, um, will feature new and newish entrants into the New Jersey news and information space. Um, and uh, they will be joined by the, uh, the, the station news heads uh, for a discussion about news collab collaboratives uh, and other strategies to leverage resources. So in closing, um, our goal for this event, I do want to emphasize that we have a goal, um, is to identify clear aspirations for New Jersey public media, um, as well as research questions. Uh, we hope to be back in another year or so to assess progress. Um, I want to, David, I just, I see you there, and I wanted to know if you had anything to add um, to. Uh, I'll add in in the conversation, well, questions and comments, but uh, certainly we're, we're really pleased to see um, what I think was a challenge also become an opportunity when it comes to public service, public media service in the state, and, um, you know, being part of the greater Philadelphia area, which is not here, I know, but uh, our region. It's very important to us, and so we, we, we see this happening not just in New Jersey generally, but around our area and the country. So we're, we're excited and think it's very important work. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, last bit of housekeeping. Um, I've been reminded to remind all of our speakers to speak into the mic for the um, digital transcription and don't touch or move them. <laughs> um, Ingrid. <laughs> I, I think we'll ask Patrick Murray and uh, Matthew, uh, Matt Hale to come up. All right, um, Ingrid's passing out a copy of uh, the latest report that we uh, issued at the Monmouth University Polling Institute uh, on awareness of uh, New Jersey public uh, broadcast media. And let me just give you a little history of the polling on this. Um, going back to uh, the early 70s, uh, I, think, I think statutorily the New Jersey Public Broadcasting Authority was created in 1967 or 69, somewhere in that vicinity, and I think the first actual broadcast was 1971. But there was a charge in there that they had to check with the public to make sure that they were doing, you know, fulfilling a, a public need. And so they actually hired the, the Eagleton Institute. The Eagleton poll knew at the time, 1971 was also when, when the poll here was founded, uh, to do these annual surveys. And they just simply asked about, you know, th things that you were interested in. Um, starting in 1981, they started asking a little bit more awareness questions, kind of getting a sense of do people understand what our brand is. And then that kind of dropped off. And then the successor organization, the foundation, the NJN Foundation, decided to start picking up on this. And that's where I came in. I was at Eagleton at the time in 1994 when we did the first study for the uh, foundation and then did another follow-up in 1999 where we looked at the audience. 
Uh, and then uh, when I went after that, I had gone to Monmouth, and in 2010, when it was clear that something was afoot with the uh, with the public broadcasting entities here, that uh, we did another survey just to see what people thought of it. But we continue to track these questions about awareness. Uh, and so uh, in September, we did it again to see if awareness of the new entities matched awareness of, of the old ones. So let me start with uh, public broadcasting TV uh, in New Jersey. Um, back in 1981, 57% of New Jerseyans were aware that there was public television in, in the state. Uh, and 27% reported that they had watched NJN in the past month. Uh, by 1988, awareness of public broadcasting had jumped to 80% and viewership to 36%. Um, overall, 12% could name the NJN brand off the top of their head. By the time we got to, uh, and that was, that was the huge jump, and then it increased incrementally from there. By the time we got to 2010, uh, the last year of, of NJN, uh, we had 79% who were aware of a public broadcasting entity, 23% who could name NJN, and 85% who had heard of NJN if you gave them the name, and 51% who reported that they watched it at least once in the past month. And now we jump to this uh, past year, and we find that awareness of public television overall has, in New Jersey has dropped slightly to 70%, down from about 8 in 10 to 7 in 10, uh, people who can name NJTV off the top of their head is now at 5%. That's compared to 23% for NJN. And the people who have heard of NJTV is 60%, uh, which was 85% for NJN. Those who, who say that they have watched it um, in the past month at least once is 25% of the state population, which is about half of what NJN claimed. I've been asked about this by some reporters who have this was released on Tuesday, so some reporters have already asked me about this. You know, I think there are some things that, that are in there. Um, one is that uh, NJN became a brand um, resource in the state. So even if you didn't watch it, it was like kind of Edison's laboratory or the state house. You knew it was there, and you knew it was part of the fabric of New Jersey. And so you reported it as such. You, you, you had an awareness of it. So NJTV hasn't, hasn't built that uh, awareness yet, and there has been a slight drop off in, in the understanding of a public television um, entity here in the state. Something that we saw happening with NJN actually over the past 10 years for the polling that we had done with them which was uh, the growth of places like News 12 New Jersey and other cable outlets like Fios 1, uh, uh, CN8 at the time, and not so much anymore, but early on in CN8, there was, there was competition there for the sense of what actually is the public entity uh, that's providing news about New Jersey. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the one thing that, that we found. Now, having said that, the people who do watch NJTV haven't necessarily seen um, a net change in the quality of the information that they get about New Jersey. Certainly some people say it's better, some people say it's worse. The vast majority say it hasn't changed, and when you add that all up together, it's the characteristic of the, of the quality of the, the characteristic of the information has changed, but the quality hasn't um, in, in terms of the people who continue to uh, watch um, NJTV. Uh, so the real issue with NJTV is, is it doesn't seem to be the quality of, of the program, but, but just simply the brand recognition, the, the cash that, uh, that NJTV uh, used to have. Um, what's interesting, though, overall, if we just look at NJTV, its rating in terms of how it does in terms of um, providing information on New Jersey is, is generally positive, even if people don't watch it. It's certainly very positive. Seventy percent of viewers say that it's positive. Um, but 38 percent of all New Jerseyans, whether they watch it or not, say it's positive versus 25 percent who would say it's negative. Now, that's a little less than those who rate News 12 and Fios 1 and those types of outlets, which is 48 percent positive to 29 percent negative, which also means that more people are aware of those um, outlets than they are of NJTV. And of course, both of those, uh, the public broadcasting and the cable, uh, commercial cable, uh, do better than the television um, affiliates in New York and Philadelphia, which are, are generally negative. Half of New Jerseyans rate the coverage of New Jersey on those outlets negative. So the, the real issue when NJN started, which was competing against the broadcast affiliates to provide information about New Jersey that wasn't being provided, is now being taken up by some of these cable outlets as well. So now NJTV is fitting into that slot and has to look at that slot as well. 
Uh, turning to radio, one of the things that we find about people, people, you know, about a quarter of New Jerseyans listen to some form of public radio, but there's a lot of confusion about exactly what the brand is that they're listening to. Um, so some people identify New Jersey public radio, some people know it as HYY, NYC, um, and so forth. Uh, but we find that among those listeners, uh, the viewership is generally positive. To compare that to the commercial broad, radio, broadcast radio, uh, mainly uh, New Jersey 101.5, which obviously is designed to provide information about the state, uh, we find that the, the ratings of the two are, are similar. Um, overall, public radio gets a 23% positive to 22% negative. Uh, New Jersey 101.5 gets a 32% positive to a 19% negative. Among listeners of public radio, 52% are positive about public radio, 33% negative. But among those same listeners, 40% are positive about 101.5 versus 22% neg negative. So there's some, they're getting different types of information from both, um, and they're looking for both types of information. And of course, if we compare those to the news and talk radio stations out of Philadelphia, both of those are doing better, uh, that it's generally negative, 38% negative to 24% positive for those in terms of the information that they provide about New Jersey. Now, I just want to end with one piece here, which is we're talking about TV and radio, um, but the, the digital prov provision of information is now becoming much more important. Back just as recently as 2005, and this question goes back uh, a, over a decade, uh, newspapers were the number one source of information about New Jersey. In two th and that was at 70% back in the 80s, and, and, and down, it's dropped, started dropping in the 90s. By 2005, it went to 48%, said newspapers. 31% said television. By the time we got to 2009, f just four years later, it switched. 41% said television, just 28% said newspapers, and 19% said the internet, up from 6% four years prior. Get to 2012, three years later, Internet is now up to 28%, just inching out newspapers at 27% with television at 34%. Uh, internet has now eaten into both television and newspapers. Now, that's not to say that those entities aren't providing the digital information on, on, online that people are going to, but that's where people are going for the information. If it, even if it's the, the Star Ledger's site, nj.com, they're going to nj.com and not to the paper for the information. And so that's a challenge to public media right now is how to provide the information in that way because you know you listen to you, you watch tv and you, and you listen to radio whether it's public or, or broadcast and they always point you to their website but it, it really is starting to be the other way around people finding the website first and then are going to decide whether they want to go to the actual broadcast medium uh, so those are the results of uh, the poll and i'll be happy to enter, entertain any questions here or at any time later Okay. Um, you know, I, I have been looking at, at local television news since 1998 and Gray Davis running for governor. I started this when I was 12, so, no, but it's been a long time. And every year I come out and I say television is horrible. Television, local television news is awful. It doesn't cover substantive issues. It doesn't cover politics in a meaningful way. It focuses on the horse race, all of those type of things. This is the first time that I've done this where I actually have some good news about television. Um, we did a, a snapshot. We did a, 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 a very sh short and quick snapshot of three television stations. We looked at NJTV, we looked at WNBC, which is the, the New York affiliate, um, number one rated in that market, and WPVI, which is an ABC affiliate, number one in, in, uh, in the Philadelphia market by, by a big margin. Um, and we, we did a, a, a collected um, uh, news programming through a, um, a, a source called TV Eyes, which is a, originally founded for finding product placement. But as a res, as, uh, so marketers can find, you know, if, if Pepsi shows up in an in a episode of Modern Families, they can find it or something like that. But they also capture full news broadcasts, which we can get. On 210, um, in 210 DMAs around the country, um, so we can we can capture this in a in a relatively um, cost efficient uh, 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 manner. Um, so we looked at the evening news broadcast from 6 to 6:30 on the three stations um, from October 1st until November 6th. 
Um, now, Sandy's right in the middle of that, obviously, and like a lot of things, she messed it up. Um, we lost um, uh, 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 some broadcasts as a result of Sandy. Um, we're not able to be captured. But overall, it's, a, it's a, a, a fairly complete set of that piece of news, Monday through Friday, by the way. We didn't do, um, didn't do weekends. It's about 39 hours of news that we sat down and watched in an orderly way. Um, so on almost, we, the, the sort of original goal of this was to look specifically at election coverage. Um, Sandy changed that in some respects um, uh, because Sandy took over. Um, for the last week of, of the campaign. Um, normally a time when election news is most prominent, um, uh, uh, election coverage essentially disappeared um, until the, the Monday and Tuesday before and, uh, uh, of, of the election, or the Monday before the election. Um, so in all, we looked, uh, uh, we captured about 39 hours of, of local news and separated that into 1,518 separate story segments. A story segment includes a traditional news story, which we can all identify, but it also, as a segment, could be ads, or sports, or weather, or my favorite, teasers. We'll be right back after this, all right? So we actually separate out all of those little um, components. And it gives us a sense of what appears on all of the news. The goal is to try and look um, uh, uh, at both how much of the news focused on New Jersey in those three stations, and also some measures of the quality of that news. The news, the information that's being provided. On almost, on, excuse me, on every measure of, qual of, of quantity of New Jersey coverage, NJTV killed WNBC and WPVI. Um, and that may not be surprising, but 89% um, of all the stories on NJTV focused on New Jersey. Um, comparatively, 17% focused uh, of the WNBC stories focused on New Jersey, and 24% of the WPVI focused on New Jersey. So if you are interested exclusively in New Jersey, NJTV is clearly uh, 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 the place to be. Um, um, okay, so we also tried to look at some sort of quality issues um, about what, what information is provided. And looking at 39 hours of coverage, um, uh, as a whole, I could tell you that there's X hundreds of thousands of seconds about um, this. But rather than do that, what we did is condense it, all of that time, into a single half hour. Imagine if all of the time, the percentages of time devoted to each topic were um, uh, in a single half hour. And through that process, a couple things um, jump out. Um, first of all, NJTV, in comparison to the networks, actually has a very different news hole. And what I mean by that is that if you look at a 30-minute broadcast, almost half of it for both WNBC and WPVI is devoted to advertising, teasers, sports, and weather. Sports and weather, we can make a case that those are important news, and but they're not news. They're not hard news in the sense um, that, that others are. But almost half. That means that the amount of news that the, the networks have um, is, is really just about 15 minutes out of a 30-minute broadcast. Um, for NJTV, um, it's, it's less. Um, for a 30-minute broadcast on um, NJTV, um, only about 19% of is devoted to advertising, um, mainly self-advertising, of course, um, but advertising and then teasers. NJTV doesn't do sports, and they only have that little scroll of the state um, for weather, right? Um, it's interesting that, that, the other, that the networks have weather for the region. New J NJTV only has NJ weather. It's like New York and, and Philadelphia, or New York and Pennsylvania don't exist on that little map that comes scrolling up. It's just New Jersey. Um, so those, that's, a, that's a, a structural difference. But then when you look at, the, at, at this, this measure of a, of a typical half hour, um, the, the networks, NBC and WPVI, focus primarily on crime. And that's a story that we've been seeing nationally. A, a, story, a, a study I did in Los Angeles showed the, the exact same thing. But out of a 30-minute news broadcast, WNBC would have devoted five minutes and 29 seconds to crime. Stories about murders and stories about robberies and stories about people breaking the law. 32% um, uh, of the, uh, of the um, 
uh, of the coverage, if you take out ads and teasers uh, on, on WNBC, was devoted to crime. So crime dominates network news. Um, in comparison, NJTV only spent about 2.8% of their um, uh, 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 time on crime. That equals 41 seconds. So in a typical half hour, NJTV would devote 41 seconds to crime. WNBC, for example, five minutes and 29 seconds. So it's a very, very different focus. Um, uh, uh, and there's also NJTV looking at election coverage. A typical NJTV broadcast in this, this formula, 10 minutes is devoted, was devoted to elections across the spectrum. I'll get more into that later. In comparison, WNBC was about two minutes and 15 seconds. WPVI was about a minute and 39 seconds. So significantly more election coverage and significantly less coverage of crime and mayhem. Okay? And that's a, that's a, a structural difference um, uh, uh, between the two stations. Um, okay, so another thing that we can look at to determine what are the priorities of stations is what do they lead with? What is the most important story? What goes first? Um, and uh, again, we see the sort of same difference. 63% of the leads, and this doesn't count Sandy, 63% of the leads on NJTV were about elections. 11% um, were about government affairs, things going on in the legislature in Trenton. 55% on WNBC and 47% of WPVI's leads were focused on crime. So that out of the box, what's most important is crime. On the networks, out of the box, what's most important to NJTV, elections. Um, and so that's another fundamental difference between the two. Um, again, I, I, we, we looked at, at, at um, the focus of the stories. Where did they focus? The vast majority of NJTV, 89% focused on um, uh, New Jersey. It would have been higher, but they have the stock ticker, right? And the stock ticker is not really New Jersey focused, so we couldn't give you credit for that. But it would have probably been higher without the stock ticker. Um, in comparison, uh, NBC is, uh, came in with New Jersey at 17% and WPVI came at 24% um, uh, coverage of New Jersey. If you think, uh, I've heard, um, I, don't, I don't personally have data for this, but about a third of the audience of WNBC and a third of the audience of WPVI actually live in New Jersey. Sort of a, uh, uh, I've heard that in several different places. Not a third of the coverage in either of those um, instances. Um, okay. The next thing that we did is we looked at and made comparisons between New Jersey-focused stories on all three stations by story topic. What, if you're going to talk about New Jersey, what is the story that you're going to tell? Okay? And again, we see very different stories. Um, on the, uh, if you combine WNBC and WPVI, um, the primary focus, 28% of the New Jersey stories were about crime. Right? So not only did crime happen in New York City, and not only did crime happen in Philadelphia, but apparently a lot of crime happens in New Jersey, according to, these, uh, to, to the uh, uh, WNBC and WPVI. Um, uh, in comparison, again, NJTV, um, their New Jersey, which is most of them, they focused 8% of their stories on New Jersey crime. All right? New Jersey's biggest um, uh, um, focus um, was actually economy, jobs, and business. Um, NJTV spends a lot of time talking about New Jersey businesses. Um, they spend a lot of time talking about Trenton, uh, government affairs. Not just Trenton, sometimes some local stuff, but they talk about what happens in, in uh, New Jersey government. Um, that was about 15%. Economy and jobs was about 18% of all of the New Jersey stories. Um, and again, New Jersey focused election coverage, about 16% of all stories. Okay? So the mix, again, even when we're in the same state is very different between the networks and, and NJTV. Um, in uh, uh, NJTV is economy, government affairs, and elections. Um, uh, the networks tend to be uh, crime. They do a lot of traffic, too. Um, uh, I, I should have meant there's a, a, about 11% of WPVI's New Jersey stories were about things happening in New Jersey on the turnpike. So, um, OK. Um, so, we're really seeing between sort of networks and um, uh, NJTV, you're telling different stories about New Jersey. You're providing very different mixes of information, um, uh, which I, I, I find interesting. Um, 
so we also we, we wanted to look at elections. We tried our best to, to look at elections, and we did it in and around um, um, Hurricane Sandy. But there's some really we we did find some interesting things. Among them, it seems like um, that one of the effects of Hurricane Sandy was that the stations may have provided more information. All three of the stations more information about voter information about voting procedures. This is where you go to get the ballot. This is how you vote. And that makes sense, right? Sandy changed all of that, so you had to tell people. And all of the stations did a fairly good job of that. Um, the networks had about 30% of their stories um, throughout the entire time period focused on giving people information about the process of voting and how to vote, OK? Um, OK, when we look at which races were covered, um, the networks totally ignored state and local races, none. Um, uh, they called. Um, NJTV, NJTV, in contrast, spent a fair amount of time with the mayor of Perth Amboy. Um, uh, now, granted, there was a bit of a controversy about you know name calling and things like that, but they they they, they covered a mayoral race. Um, uh, uh, they even gave a little bit of time to a special election in the fourth district. Um, they gave both candidates a little bit of of, of time. Um, uh, so. If you want to talk about local elections, NJTV is the only place to get it um, or, uh, among these stations. Um, the networks also completely ignored, for the most part, congressional races. Um, WPVI has a series of stories um, that profile both um, congressional candidates. Only one of them aired um, within the particular time period. They may have aired earlier. They may have been bumped by Sandy. They do have a, a, a package of congressional stuff, and one of them aired, um, but they were essentially ignored. Whereas w NJTV gave interviews, extensive substance-based interviews for New Jersey's first, fourth, fifth, ninth, and twelfth, and the ones that we, we found. So there was a significant amount of, of congressional coverage um, um, on NJTV. NJTV also covered ballot question one quite a bit. Um, they, they gave um, uh, uh, overall about 11% were, were covered uh, of, their, of their stories focused on, on ballot questions, both one and, one and two. I, I will say that NJTV was a very, very clear booster of um, ballot question one, very much in favor of the stories. There was, I, I think there was about eight total stories. Seven of these stories were, um, to my mind, advertisements for passing ballot question one. Um, one they did, to their credit, um, I, I think, bring on an opponent of ballot question one and interview the opponent of ballot question one. But the stories were framed that this is a bipartisan, this is a wonderful thing. I think it's a wonderful thing, too, but it, you know, they, 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 they did do that. Um, OK. Um, with Senate races in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut, um, uh, th there was plenty of things to cover about the U.S. Senate. WPVI uh, and um, NJTV actually spent about the, most, uh, the same amount of time. 24% of their election coverage was focused on U.S. Senate race. But remember, it took Philadelphia two Senate elections to get the same percentage as it took NJTV to get one. They covered both the Pennsylvania race and the New Jersey race, whereas NJTV <laughs> focused almost all of their coverage on the New Jersey uh, uh, U.S. Um, Senate race. Um, overall, all three of the stations devoted the most amount of election coverage to the presidential race. Um, three out of ten stories were devoted on NJTV to the president, four out of ten on WPVI, and almost six out of ten on WNBC. Um, and that's fairly typical. Top of the tip get, gets, gets the most news. Um, uh, again, if you look at which state they focused on, 79% of NJTV's election stories sort of were focused, um, had a New Jersey hook to them. Um, and that might seem like it's a little bit off, but if, for example, a uh, business owner in um, uh, Manaloking puts up an enormous anti-Obama display in their front window, um, it would be coded as a presidential story, but New Jersey focused. So that's just a, a little technical overlap. Um, uh, again, 79% of New Jersey's elect of, of NGT's election stories were focused on New Jersey, compared to 24% for WPBI and 15% for WNBC. So New Jer NJTV not only covered more elections, they covered more New Jersey elections um, uh, than anybody else. Um, before I get into some, sort of some quick impressions. Um, uh, NJTV and, and, the, and the other two um, 
spent a lot of time talking about horse race and strategy issues. 35% um, of NJTV's uh, stories were about strategy. 33% um, on NBC were about strategy. 48% of WPVI stories were about the game of, of politics. So on, in terms of horse race and strategy, NJTV is sort of right in the mix. However, 30% of NJTV stories were about substantive issues in the campaign. Differences between candidates as opposed to difference between hairdos. Um, and uh, uh, in comparison, WNBC was only 10% and WPVI was only 19%. So um, the difference comes in is that WNBC and WPVI did cover more voter information stories. That's affected by Sandy, but they did give more process stories about voting um, than NJTV did. Okay? So those are numbers, and I have a copy of the full report for anybody who wants it. There's a summary of it that I think all of you were handed out. Um, I do want to sort of end with some impressions. Having watched all of this news, um, th there's some things that numbers aren't going to get across particularly well, okay? And this may come across as advice. This may come across as, as hopes. Um, but I, 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 I think that they're, they're, they're interesting. Um, the first thing that I would say is before the next storm, please, I, pr I, I beg everyone affiliated with NJV, please buy your reporters foul weather gear. <laughs> I f we watched this and felt so bad for the reporters who seemed that they had, had found whatever they had and, you know, were, were, were showing up with, you know, mismatched outfits to stay dry and warm. And we felt, we felt terrible for them. As a, and you look at WNBC and WPVI, um, you know, their logo emblazoned, matching, you know, foul weather Arctic gear. Um, now, and, and, you know, there was, there was one NJTV story where the, the reporter actually was wiping the camera. Another where she was answering cell phones. Now, it's funny, right? All of those things are, 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 are funny things, but it does speak to a very clear resource differences between the networks and NJTV, right? And, it, and, and those show up in production values, right? And, and I, I, to my mind, that does have an effect. I, we were so busy worried about the reporters and so scared of the, that they were going to you know, blow away and, and freeze to death that, that we couldn't focus as much on what they were saying. So the production values matter, and I think that's an area that NJTV needs to, to, to certainly improve in. Um, uh, on a, on a, we have a sense, again, in a sense, and this is a really, I think, nice story, that... NJTV reporters use us and we, whereas WNBC reporters and WPVI reporters use you and them. And I'm not sure if that's thought, thought out or not, but NJTV people would say, we need to do X to be safe. This has been difficult for us. Whereas NBC and WPVI say, you need to do this to be safe. And this has been really difficult for this poor family that I just shot over here. Right? That's a fundamental difference in tone that I think is something that NJTV, please hold on to that. Um, uh, um, I, I know I'm running sort of short on time. Um, uh, WPVI is a shameless self-promoter. Um, I'll give you an example. During the storm, they brought their truck to neighborhoods without power and shot it while neighbors were coming and plugging in their cell phones. Right? Yes, it's a nice thing to do, and yes, they gave these poor, you know, seven people power. But that is in shameless self-promotion, right? Um, they held a telethon, which they shot and which they covered. Their reporters were constantly and regularly shown at community events, at schools, at churches, getting awards, giving awards, being in the community. And they shot it and they put it as part of, of, of the news. Don't make all of that the news, but you should do a little bit of that. No, NJTV does none of that sort of, this is us in the community. This is the reporters in the community. This is what we do. And I think that has an effect on people. I think seeing them at events, seeing them on TV at events, is something that can help grow the brand, help people to know more about NJTV. And I would encourage that. Lastly, I'll, 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 I'll say, um, at times, NJTV spends a lot of time inside Trenton Baseball. Um, they let the camera roll when politicians are talking and talking and talking and talking about issues that are complex. 
Um, I would encourage NJTV reporters to put a little more context and a little bit more framing of what, um, rather than just letting the cameras roll. There was a tendency, um, and, and I think that's an area. Um, NJTV is um, also very business friendly um, to New Jersey business. Um, one of my coders at one point says, uh, sent uh, an email saying, it seems to me like New Jersey comedy, uh, the New Jersey economy is booming. Is it really doing that? <laughs> After watching NT NJTV, okay? So there is a tendency to be very boosterism towards um, uh, 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 New Jersey economy. And, you know, you, we can go back and forth on that. But that's a, an impression that we noted. So in conclusion, NJTV is an amazing asset. NJTV is an amazing, um, uh, provides fantastic news in comparison to these other two stations of New Jersey. Um, but please, please buy them some jackets. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And while they're getting settled, I'll just, um, we have a somewhat unusual format for this panel, too. So we'll start with um, our, our station executives. And um, we, we have about uh, an hour and a half, no, an hour and 10 minutes for this, um, this panel. And in the middle, we'll bring up um, uh, their news heads who have various titles, so I'm just going to use the term um, news heads, uh, to join them and to, to get into more detail about content. So um, what our executives are going to focus on is sort of overall strategy at the stations for um, uh, New Jersey coverage, New Jersey engagement, and then general um, uh, pressing issues of uh, uh, resources, finances, staffing, um, uh, audience development, and the mission of public media. Um, I guess when we get to questions to Q&A, since we, we um, didn't allow Q&A of our uh, researchers, maybe if they can be available for, for questions then. So if you have questions um, about the polling and the content analysis, please hold them um, for then. Um, okay, so I'm not going to introduce the three of you. You have, um, and probably all know uh, who, who they are and you have their titles. Um, so I guess I'd like to go, maybe starting with Laura, um, and give each of you a chance um, to talk for five to ten minutes. Um, and I would like the focus of your remarks to be both, it's a retrospective, right? You've had sort of a year um, uh, to begin operations in New Jersey. Um, what you think you've achieved and what some of the challenges have been, but especially focusing over the next couple of years, what do you see as um, the real opportunities uh, as well as needs in New Jersey? Laura. Sure. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you all for um, pulling this together because I think it's really uh, fascinating to um, be able to sit here a year after and kind of uh, collectively kind of say, how are we doing? And um, I think the news on the news is good and i think the next couple of years are going to be really um uh, a wonderful time for growth uh in terms of the uh journalism service that we provide to new jersey so um i, I uh just a couple of facts you know we are uh an organization that has seven radio stations uh, the four that we bought uh, from the new jersey network which are 88.1 trenton 88.5 sussex uh, 89.3 Netcong and 90.3 Tom's River Seaside Park. Um, and then we, the, of the other three stations we have, WQXR is licensed to Newark and WNYC AM uh, has a transmitter in Kearney, New Jersey. So we're very uh, New Jersey oriented in, in many ways. And in fact, uh, um, more than a third of our listeners um, of all of our properties to terrestrial radio uh, are in New Jersey. So we have served New Jersey um, you know, for quite a while, but this has been a great opportunity for us um, when we uh, when the opportunity presented itself uh, for us to significantly enhance our service to New Jersey residents, um, we jumped at it. And with the help of many foundations in this room and others here, we've been able to start building a, a much stronger um, journalism uh, force here. Um, and in fact, we now reach 75% of the population of New Jersey. 
um, through, w, through our stations, WNYC, AM, FM, uh, QXR, and the four New Jersey stations. So uh, we are proud to be the largest public radio uh, service in New Jersey. And our goal is to create a culture of civic engagement, community conversation, and accountability that will serve the uh, public good in New Jersey for years to come. Um, and uh, the acquiring the stations was one prong. The other prong is really developing a comprehensive news bureau. Um, and we have um, really increased our coverage of New Jersey, in both on the air on the New Jersey stations and also on WNYC AM and FM. Um, and I think that's important because we're bringing uh, news about New Jersey to New Jerseyans, but also to New Yorkers and others. And uh, we're doing it on our main news channels as well as the, the somewhat uh, smaller New Jersey uh, station channels. Um, we are, like, before we started this effort a year ago, we were producing about um, five to six stories a month, features uh, a month through our morning edition and All Things Considered. We're now producing about 20 stories a month. So there's been significant increase in the number of features and news hits that we've uh, devoted to New Jersey. And Brian Lair, who many of you know as a host on WNYC and who is now on, also heard on the New Jersey stations, um, has probably doubled the amount of coverage that he's giving to New Jersey. Um, so we have about 10 stories on New Jersey a month uh, in the Brian Lair show. Those are around 15 to 20 minute segments. And then uh, our managing editor, Nancy Solomon, appears on the program about five times a month. So uh, that is really the, that's the beginning of an increased output. Uh, and my news head, um, Jim Schachter, who is over here, will, when he joins, can talk a little bit more about uh, the efforts that we're um, making to uh, to really do more in-depth coverage, but I'll just say a few words. First of all, he is a resident of Summit and uh, comes to us from uh, the New York Times um, where he spent 17 years. And he joined us just this past uh, summer and I think he told me that one of the reasons was was uh, that it was a great opportunity to, to build kind of news coverage in his home state. Um, many of you know Nancy Solomon, who's a resident of South Orange, New Jersey. And uh, she was our first pair of boots on the ground, and she's covered New Jersey for NPR for the past 10 years and won a bunch of awards, and just recently won a front page award from the News Women's Club of New York for her coverage as part of New Jersey Public Radio. Um, and she has spent a lot of time in the last year or so diving deep into critical New Jersey issues like education across, across the state and poverty in Newark. Um, Bob Henley, many of you know. Um, you kind of, if you know us, you know Bob Henley. He's another one of our great reporters, and he broke the story about Governor Christie's secret campaign funds. And Nancy and colleagues like Bob, um, Anna Sale, Scott Gurian, um, reported uh, at, from New Jersey during Superstorm Sandy. And one of the things we found um, was it was a, a great celebration of the old medium of radio because so many people were without power that uh, you know we, we found the, the uh, stations um, w were really able to serve a huge need in New Jersey as people were looking for information. And uh, despite the fact that our AM station in Kearney went off the air for a little bit, we're back up there. We're still actually not on full power there. And um, Seaside Heights uh, also um, uh, went off uh, the air several times, but we got it back up. Um, our, and I think it's really uh, an important and interesting time to, to be looking, obviously, as reporters in New Jersey as we look at uh, the tough questions facing the state uh, that took uh, that really took the brunt of the storm and looking at the rebuilding we're having um, uh, our reporters looking at the aid issues um, really following rebuilding a along the shore looking at life after Sandy we have a, a project that is looking both in New York and New Jersey at life after Sandy and and Jim will talk about about more of this I'll just say just a couple of uh, additional words about the business model and about what I hope in the next few years I mean we are we announced on May 15th that we were part of the New Jersey radio news uh, um, that that is going to be head catered headquartered uh, at Montclair State, as it, it's really a member of the New Jersey News Commons. And that's really, really exciting. Um, uh, that is an opportunity for us to be sitting next to our colleagues from 
um, New Jersey Television, from WHYY, from um, NJ, NJ.com, uh, from um, many places around uh, the state where we'll all be sharing kind of a, a, an office and studio space and production facilities. Uh, and in return, we'll also be working with the Montclair State uh, interns and doing w workshops and classroom visits. And uh, so we're really excited uh, about working with those folks, with WBGO, the Heckinger Report we're doing some, some work with, of course, NJ Spotlight, our friends at NJ Spotlight. Uh, and the patch, um, and so that this is really exciting. I think the part of the vision that we had, um, you know, we were interested in in acquiring the stations because we felt they should stay in public radio hands. Frankly, they're kind of they don't reach as many people um, as our WNYC stations. But the real interest for us was in starting uh, and deepening our commitment to high quality news and in depth news in. Uh, for New Jerseyans and also for New Yorkers, we've had. Um, I, I, I was. Uh, I ran into um, to Feather on the way in, and 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 I was on the phone, and 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 she she said, "Are you? What are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm I'm calling because I don't believe this statistic, you know, that I'm about to say." And my staff tells me it's true that we have seen a 40 percent increase in membership from New Jersey uh, in the last 16 months. And that's amazing. Now they, I, you know, because I I, 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 I was like, I don't really believe that, but uh, I do now because they, <laughs> they told me it really is true. Um, and uh, that is a real testament to the to the coverage that we're doing and the work that we're doing in New Jersey, uh, both on you know the stuff that's heard on WNYC on, uh, on and on, on New Jersey Public Radio. Um, so I I will uh, stop there. Just one last thing I would just say. Um, we are about to hire some new um, reporters to, who will be based here, in, in addition to Nancy and Bob and, and others here. And that will be able, we're going to be doubling and hopefully even ad uh, adding more reporters uh, here. And that, combined with the work that I think we can do at Montclair State with our colleagues, uh, will, I think, really dramatically amplify um, what we can do both on the radio and on the internet. And I would say that's the other thing that I, as I look uh, ahead for in the next couple of years, that we look at just not just the, the radio piece, but also building out uh, experiences with um, both features as well as data journalism uh, and other kinds of interactive elements in the digital space. So thank thanks, you. thanks, Laura. So um, we'll turn now to Neil, CEO of uh, WNET, uh, NJTV. So most of your work was already done for you by the previous <laughs> panel. I was going to yield the balance of my time to. <laughs> yeah. that panel. And, you know, in fact, I was thinking uh, about two years ago when we got word or heard rumblings that the Governor Christie was thinking of ending all all support for New Jersey Public Television. Um, and I said to my board, I don't think we can let that happen. And someone said, Well, why? There are commercial stations in New York and Philadelphia. Surely they'll cover it. What's the big deal? So if I had you back then, um, but I think, I think the, the great work that, um, that Matthew did said very clearly there's real value and real need in having a, uh, New Jersey should not be the only state that doesn't have its own public television station, that it does real good, that has a real separate agenda. And I was proud but when you talked about uh, a difference in philosophy and tone. That's not accidental. That's purposeful. Um, we, when, we, when we took over operation of the station, we knew exactly what we wanted to do. And those numbers bared out. We wanted to be the station that was not that, that, that did not uh, follow the philosophy that if it, if it bleeds, it leads. We wanted to be talk, talk about the news that makes a difference and the important issues that matter. Even if they weren't necessarily television friendly, we wanted to make sure we covered them. And the tone was going to I'm the only one affiliated with a station who lives in New York. Everybody else involved in our station lives in New Jersey. Um, and to make it very much a New Jersey institution. So I'm glad to see that our story selection was borne out in your, in your research. Um, our challenge was even was more complicated. We really had to redefine what a public television station was like. Um, when the governor decided ending all funding, both outright uh, tax support and other things like gifts and buildings and institutions, I mean, that was a loss of about $20 million, depending on how you figure it. So we were talking about doing a, uh, covering the state with two-thirds less money than the previous administration had. So in some ways, I look at that research and say, people don't see a difference in quality, yet we're spending two-thirds less. That's an incredible achievement. Um, and part of it's because we had to redefine how to make this work. And the reason I thought it was so important that we step in is to really take advantage of what I think will be the new model. And I think New Jersey will someday look back and say, we've taken credit. We have shown the future for public television. Some of these small stations cannot exist unless they work with larger stations. The smart thing is to leverage the, the resources of larger stations um, who have all the infrastructure already. 
and that you concentrate the firepower you have on what you want to do locally. I mean, that's the only way we've been able to make that work. It's been um, adventuresome. We have discovered new things. We, we have led the way in new technology, and I think that's going to echo across public television, maybe across the media, um, and how to do things better and different. Can, can you say what you mean? Sure. For example, um, uh, I'll give you two examples. One is we have um, a relationship with universities across the state. There are seven of them in which we have small um, Internet cameras that are fixed in a room with lights. You walk in, you flick the lights, and you can talk to people. Now, in the old days of television, you would send seven satellite trucks rolling with an engineer and a cameraman who would set up and string cable and run satellites back, and now you flick a switch and you're on. And that's an investment, I think, like $5,000 per place to set it up. We're in seven uh, college and universities now. We're talking to three more. One of them rhymes with Utgers. Um, <laughs> and we want to do even more of that. So that's one example. Um, the other is and, uh, these new live units, and we use them in the storm. Um, and they are, instead of having a big satellite truck, they're small units, and they work across, they, they search like a, they're in a backpack, and they search for any telephone frequency. Um, and you can broadcast live from almost anywhere. And we were leasing them, and now I think we've raised enough money to buy, to buy them. So that, to me, an example, once again, new technology. The viewer can't tell the difference, but it saves a lot of money. And so therefore, you, you have the money you have spent on the reporters and the products you, you want to do. Uh, I also want to talk about partnerships a little bit, echoing what Laura said. Um, part of the success of this has been and will continue to be taking advantage of the other partners around the state. We work extensively with newspapers, with other nonprofits, with, with bloggers and Patch. Um, Laura's people have been on, on, air, on our air. Um, we look forward to Montclair when we'll all be together and we can do it even more. But even when we started, we thought that was a huge advantage. Um, another advantage we've had by using our expertise, actually primetime ratings in New Jersey are up. More people are watching New Jersey public television now than watched it before. Um, we're down a little bit in news, in part is because we lost the lottery, and the live lottery drawings used to drive a lot of NJTV's ratings. Um, it also cost $2 million a year to do that, and we said we're not going to spend $2 million on lottery drawings. Um, however, we have, there was virtually no web strategy before, so we have a web team. Um, we now have 10 or 15,000 people who watch the show on the web. We have 43,000 people a month who are watching us on YouTube. Um, we're going to do more of that. That's where, that's where media needs to go. Uh, we're actually doing more New Jersey broadcasting than ever before. We, we told the state we do 20 hours a week. We average 24 hours a week. Um, we, have been, we want to be increasingly nimble. Um, and so we, when something like a storm comes across, it's true we don't have all the toys the big boys do. And we certainly don't have the, uh, all the weather gear, though I think you've given me a great idea for our next pledge campaign. Um, <laughs> But we did do, for those of you, if you remember Governor Christie's announcements in the bunker, you saw that because of an NJTV camera. We were the only camera there. And that was shared not, not just in New Jersey, but around the country. Um, and our reporters, I thought, were there on uh, uh, doing great job, doing more special reports, I think, than had ever been done before. Um, going forward, our challenge, one of them is, uh, I think, how do we balance the fact, that I think, of, of uh, the great work Matthew's done, which I think is a great report card. I, if you told me, and after 18 months, that would be our report card, I would take that. Um, and I bounce it against our reputation that, the, that, that, that your stu study says, and I think a couple of things. I think first in 18 months, you're not going to have the same re reputation as somebody does in 18 years, and it's going to take some time. Um, but we have two things. I'd like to say what our biggest challenges and opportunities. Our biggest challenge is, you know, we, we are frankly pulling us off now uh, by the skin of our teeth. Going forward, we want to do more, and our sources of the wills and... and, and um, <coughs> Uh, we need more support to do it. Now, if you're a New Jersey resident, you have been supporting public television, whether you liked it or not. Your tax, you, you're there in your tax dollars. Now you're not. So the message I need to get out to people of New Jersey, if you like public television, it's your, it's your station. You know, I am here under the guidance from my board that just break even. That's my humble goal. All right? But if I don't, you'll, back, you'll be back being the only station that doesn't have public television. And I think given all the great report card we got over the first 18 months, that would be a tragedy. I'll just say moving on, in addition to news, which we've talked about, I think other things we want to do, we think there's a great opportunity for, for live town halls. Um, we can do it with our colleagues on the radio as well. But I think so, uh, we have something in the works we want to talk about, about post-Sandy. Post there are huge issues facing the state. There are issues about infrastructure and government policy and how do we build and where do we build. And they sweep not just across the state, they sweep across the region. And I think it's a great opportunity for public media to come together and examine that. Um, one thing I thought was interesting about, about the survey we just heard, Yes, it's true about what New Jersey and Philadelphia cover, but I guarantee if you looked at it now and said what happened to Sandy coverage, New Jersey and Philadelphia have gone back to covering what they used to cover. We cover Sandy every single day. 
right? And we can do it repeatedly because that's what the people of New Jersey deserve. Thank you, Neil. Um, okay, turning now to Kara McGrath, Executive Vice President and COO of WHYY and the southern part of the state, which has, um, in some ways, is more challenging because the population density is lower. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for the opportunity to be here. Um, and as Ellen mentioned, we had done this, I guess, about 14 months ago um, in Camden. And I applaud Ripple and Eagleton for having us come back to say, well, 14 months later, what are you guys up to? So here we are. Um, as Ellen mentioned, we acquired five radio stations uh, in southern New Jersey for a combination of cash and in-kind contribution. And those five are Cape May Courthouse, Atlantic City, Manahawken, Bridgeton, and Berlin. Uh, we began operating them in July of 2011, and then the deal closed in February of 2012. Um, when we did this panel 14 months ago, um, in my comments, I said we've always covered southern New Jersey because it's part of our territory. Um, but when NJN existed, uh, we saw them as kind of the, the prime um, station there. And so um, we, we didn't do as much. But we, you know, we have had a longstanding arrangement with WBGO in Trenton. We share a reporter. Phil Gregory is the current reporter. Uh, before Phil Gregory, it was Eugene Son. You may remember him. He's now our FM news director. So he's very, very familiar with the state. Uh, ha has a lot of experience there. Um, our aspiration, um, of course, is to do more, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, I just want to take a minute to say um, we have this aspiration. We have this mission to do more. Uh, but it's tempered somewhat by the reality of public media today. Um, just to look, we have many sources of revenue. Um, <coughs> you know about our pledge drives, you know, direct mail, all of that. Um, one source is government funding. And not that long ago, about 15%, 12 to 15% of WHYY's operating budget came from government sources. Um, in terms of the federal government, uh, if you follow that, um, it's holding pretty steady right now, but we don't know what, you know, tomorrow is going to bring. From the state of Pennsylvania, we used to get 1.1 million a year. In a year, that went to 100,000, and now it's zero. And there's really no prospect for that coming back. Um, our TV license is in Wilmington, and so we get a grant in aid from the state of Delaware. At the high point, that was about $660,000. That went down over a series of years to $75,000. Last year, it doubled, so it's at 150. Um, and of course, we've never received anything from the state of New Jersey and, and still don't. So, um, and so we've had to go from, as I said, 12 to 15 percent down to nine, and so we've had to fill that revenue um, in other ways. And the main way we've done it is primarily with more underwriting support. Those are the support announcements you hear, you know, support for WHYY comes from. We call that underwriting. Uh, that's increased, and also with more from members and donors. So we've had to fill in that gap because we have not, um, we have not reduced our operating budget. So what are we doing? Um, Chris Satullo, our Vice President for News and Civic Dialogue, is on the next panel, and he'll get into um, a lot more of the details. But um, just some of the things I wanted to say is, since we took over these stations, in everything we do, New Jersey is much more top of mind. So when you listen to Radio Times, which is our two-hour call-in program in the morning, we have a lot more topics now about New Jersey. We have a lot more New Jersey experts. And so you're not hearing just an expert from the University of Pennsylvania. You're hearing somebody from Rutgers. You're hearing somebody from Princeton. So they're making an effort to get out there and get experts from a much wider swath um, of our listening area. Um, Newsworks Tonight, which is our nightly newscast at 6 p.m. Again, more New Jersey stories. Um, we have a partnership with New Jersey Spotlight with John Mooney, who, was, who I saw a little bit earlier here. He's often on Newsworks tonight. He was on Tuesday night. Uh, so we do a lot of that. Um, when, I was, uh, when we had the panel back in November of 2011, I said one of the things that we wanted to do was to create a New Jersey vertical on our new online news and information service. In November of 2010, we started Newsworks which is um, an online news and information service, newsworks.org. 
And when we started that, we didn't have a New Jersey page. When we were um, in the process of taking over these stations, we wanted to do a special page just for New Jersey news. And we did start that up in March of 2012. Um, the way we did it was to stop doing some other things at HYY and repurpose those assets into covering New Jersey. Um, so New Jersey is prominent on Newsworks, um, even beyond the vertical. If you had looked at Newsworks yesterday, which I hope a lot of you did, um, you would have seen that one of our top stories yesterday on the homepage was the Grounds for Sculpture's New East Gallery. Um, one of the three banner stories that ran across the top of Newsworks was headlined, Chris Christie's Gun Logic, New Jersey Governor Ready to Talk About Stricter Laws. Also on the uh, home page, you could see uh, a link to the governor video of uh, Governor Christie's State of the State Address, and also there was a link to a transcript on that. Um, we also have a blogger from the shore, Jen Miller, who does a lot um, along the shore. And um, in, in we find a very important strategy for having more coverage is to partner. And so we, as I mentioned, we have a partnership with New Jersey Spotlight, with Jersey Bites, with New Jersey Arts News, and also JerseyArts.com. So all of their content is on Newsworks, and then they have access to content that we've, we've created. We've also, um, on the news side, um, started doing a lot of events in the community. So since we took over those stations, um, we've had five kind of news-oriented events in New Jersey. We've done three town hall meetings. We had one in Princeton, one in Burlington, and one in Cherry Hill. <coughs> and then we had panel discussions on uh, Governor Christie at midterm. That was in Princeton. And we also did a land use forum in Moorestown last November. So um, in order to do more, uh, we need more resources, so we're working very hard uh, to increase our support in New Jersey, to win more friends um, and increase our support. Um, in terms of members and donors, um, from the time we took over the radio stations until now, um, of WHYY members and donors, we've increased the percentage from New Jersey from 22% to 24%. Um, at the same time, though, uh, our percentage of member and donor revenue from New Jersey has held steady at 20%. Um, in order to win more friends, uh, in addition to the issues forums that we've held, we've also done a lot of meet and greet events. Um, in the 18 months since we took over the radio stations, we've done nine, to nine events in New Jersey, so about one every other month. So in addition to the town hall meetings and the public policy forums that I mentioned, uh, we've done a meet and greet with Clifford the Big Red Dog. That was a very popular one at <laughs> Johnson's Corner Farm in Medford. Um, we had Lydia Bastianich, the great Italian chef, in Trenton. Ira Glass did an event for us in Princeton, and Mike McGrath, who is the host of You Bet Your Garden, uh, did an event for us in, in Cherry Hill that was very well attended. And as a sneak preview for everyone here today, um, Terry Gross is going to be doing an event in Princeton in May. So you can stay tuned for more, uh, more on that, more to come. Um, I mentioned earlier that with the decline in government funding, uh, we've seen an increase, we've had to increase our underwriting as a means of support. Um, and as you know, Ellen mentioned in her opening comments, um, the radio stations were there, but there was not a lot of attention given to them. So in the first year, when we took over the radio stations, from what we were told the underwriting was for that year, we increased, we saw our underwriting support from those stations increase by 71%. And now this year, compared to last year, we've seen an additional increase of 46%. So we feel very good about the um, amount of support. The trend looks good for what we're getting from underwriting. Um, so just um, in conclusion, Ellen had asked us to talk about um, a number of topics. Um, one of them that uh, I think I've covered all of them except one about um, competitive posture. She had asked us to talk about that. and. Um, 
I think we all feel we need to collaborate um, and not be competitive. And we've seen in collaborating with New Jersey Spotlight, New Jersey Arts, all of those, it's, it's worked really well for us. And so I think the model going forward for the three of us is really collaboration. Um, and uh, we're working now in terms of Sandy, we've all covered Sandy, but we're talking about a joint production to come up later, um, later this year on Sandy, and I think that could be a very good model for collaboration going forward among the three of us. Thank you, Kara. Um, okay, before we bring up um, the rest of the panel, I want to do three things, one of which is get questions from you. Um, so we'll do that. And the other two is I want to pose a question, and I also want to bring into this discussion um, Matthew Frankel, since Matthew, you've heard the New Jersey News Commons mentioned, Matthew is um, uh, director of um, Montclair University's School of, let's see if I can get this right, Montclair University School of Communications and Media Center for Cooperative Media, which runs the New Jersey News Commons. Um, my question, so, so we're gonna, I, I'm hoping that Matthew can help work through a little bit what, what um, uh, the going theory is on collaboration. Um, my question deals with a different theory, which is about civic engagement. So Laura, you mentioned that, and obviously civic engagement is um, central to um, WHYY's Newsworks. Um, so in the old days, the broadcast medium, um, civic engagement was whatever the broadcast medium decided to push out. Um, today, you know, one might say people are civically engaged with whatever they want to be on Twitter and Facebook, and um, they relate to you as a source of information, but are not necessarily engaged with you. How do you how do you think about civic engagement, and how do you do it? And I open it up to any of you. Well, I, I would just start by saying I think there are a couple of ways. Um, one, we're out in the community talking about some of the issues. So we had in Newark, I think it was in, in the fall, we had a com our community advisory board, which is kind of a board that, that is charged with finding out what, does, what are some of the community needs, decided to go to Newark and uh, ha had an open forum where we were there uh, and anyone was welcome to come and tell us what kind of issues we should be covering. Um, that's a kind of a, you know, in-person way of doing it. We're, we're going to do a similar thing in, um, at NJPAC on March 20th, actually, about education. And so we'll, they'll, we'll have a panel talking about some of the issues of education, but also really listening to people uh, in New Jersey saying, this is, you know, this is what's important to me. Um, I would say, secondly, we, uh, another kind of, um, you know, old media way of doing this is talk shows. And we have a lot of callers from New Jersey on Brian Lehrer's show. Uh, and, you know, uh, whether they're calling about Sandy or they're calling about Christie or whatever, or just an issue that they, uh, a, a book that they read, you know, there's a lot of engagement there. And then thirdly, I think in the digital realm, um, you know, through crowdsourcing and through uh, other means where we're looking at data about New Jersey, that's another way that uh, I think we, we can have more engagement. Mm -hmm. I would add to all those, and we do similar things. Um, we're thinking also some big events, which um, we've done one, we did one on, on American Graduate Day about dropouts, and it was a seven hour effort across public television. And the idea was instead of just doing a report about here's the issue, it was inviting community um, groups from around the state and country, in fact, every station to get people together and say, spotlight the groups you think are important, put them on television, and for the first time we put 800 numbers up, we didn't ask for money. It was 800 <laughs> numbers to say, just get, just get involved, get information, volunteer, and the whole idea was to, to give more attention to these great organizations and say, how can we use our public media as a way to convene great groups and have the public engage with them, and I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Um. As I mentioned earlier, we had the, uh, the town hall forums in New Jersey. And just uh, to give you an idea of what that is, we did the same thing um, in, in Delaware. We work with a group at the University of Pennsylvania called the Penn Project for Civic Engagement. And they have a lot of experience in doing citizen forums. Uh, so around the Wilmington mayor's race, which just occurred in November, we had three public forums, three or four around Wilmington, where we had a session, invited the public to come in, and in a moderated discussion, talk about what were the issues that were important to them. Then we took the results of those, those forums and used those questions and issues to inform the moderator of the debate that we had with the Wilmington mayoral candidates. 
So that's kind of a model we've used in, in Wilmington. We've uh, used it in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. We've started to do that in New Jersey. And so it's something you know, we'll continue to do because we think it's an important element of our off-air work. Thank you. Matthew Frankel, do you want to um, say anything about the New Jersey News Commons? What's the vision and how's it going? Do you have uh, here? Yeah. There's a microphone. Oh. Hi, everybody. Hello. Stand up, please. Okay. Hello. Um, does this work? Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, let me take a step back and and just recognize the work that's being done here. Um, you know, the work that WHYY is doing, the the work that NJPR is doing, and the work um, that NJTV is doing is hard stuff, and it takes money, and it takes resources, it takes labor. And most of all, it takes a commitment. And I, I, I've been amazed overall over the course of the last year to see the kind of true commitment these individuals and these organizations have had as it relates to strengthening the voice of New Jersey. And I think that's why we're all here. I think that's a vision all of us share. And it's something that, you know, I see Bob Mills do this every day when he comes into the office uh, at Montclair State and, and John Servideo and, and others. Um, and, and Nancy Solomon, who will so, soon be moving into the university. And, and I think it's something that we need to celebrate, and luckily Ingrid has brought us all together to do that, and it's something we need to strategize and think about together as a group. So I think when it regards to collaboration, much of the collaboration that's going to be done in the state are going to be done by these media entities, um, and hopefully in some capacity all of us can support uh, what they are doing and what they are committed to doing. Um, as it relates to the university, um, we, um, we, are, we are launching a school, um, or we have launched a school um, uh, for media and communication. It is uh, directed by Merrill Brown, who is my boss, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, one important entity of our school is, is, this, is the center which, uh, which was referenced. And what the, so the, what the Center of Cooperative Media is focused on most of all is looking to leverage the resources of the university to strengthen the voice of the state, to strengthen and, and assist various media entities, and to hopefully build collaborative efforts um, as best we can. And for, the re for, the, for reference or for, for some point of fact as it relates to this uh, event, I think there are probably two examples that I'd like to showcase. One was referenced before, which is we are creating, and we, or we have created, um, a focal point, a hub, for all the major media entities, or excuse me, most of the media, major, major media entities in the state of New Jersey. Um, all of them are going to be located on our campus. Um, we have, luckily, NJTV, we have uh, NJPR, NJ.com, Patch New Jersey, WBGO, and others. Um, John Mooney's here, New Jersey Spotlight, obviously is part of that group. And the vision behind that is really to create a centralized hub where people can communicate with each other, where they can work together, where John Mooney at NJ Spotlight can walk down the hall and bump into Nancy, Nancy Solomon at NJPR and maybe apply for a grant together. Or maybe someone from NJ.com can meet with someone over at NJTV and decide, you know what, let's leverage our resources, let's utilize our resources and cover a story that normally wouldn't be covered in the state of New Jersey. And that's our hope as it relates to creating this focal point um, for, for the state. And, and I liken it mo most of all to maybe a national press club for the state of New Jersey. For those of you who are interested, um, we would love, we, we love to show it off. We will be happy to provide tours or, or have conversations with any of you who are interested, uh, whether it be getting involved or simply just out of curiosity. Um, I think the second thing that was referenced as well, which just to provide a little more context to, um, is the New Jersey News Commons, which is one of the center's first initiatives that we're supporting um, with the help, with the significant help of the Dodge Foundation, the Knight Foundation, and others. Um, and, the, and the real idea behind the New Jersey News Commons is to create a centralized umbrella organization that can help instill collaboration among most digital news sites throughout the state. So obviously we have these folks involved. Uh, we also have a number of other news and information and hyperlocal sites throughout the state. And, and the work that's gone on um, as it relates to the New Jersey News Commons has been substantial. It's been led by Debbie Gallant, who uh, I like to say the university uh, uh, basically stole away from Baristanet, um, and she's been a wonderful asset to us. 
Um, it's been incubated by the likes of, of minds uh, such as Chris Daggett and, 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 and Jeff Jarvis, who's here today as well. Um, and and I, I think as it relates to collaborative efforts, we'll be able to see a lot more um, from the commons in the coming weeks and months, especially as it relates to some of the Sandy efforts that are going on within the state. But most of all, I, again, I would point everyone to the work that we're doing at the center, to point everyone to this hub, this national press club for the state of New Jersey that we've tried to create. And, and again, if I could just reemphasize the point that, that, that the work that these media entities are doing, the commitment that they've shown this state has been remarkable, and it's something that we all have to find our own special way of supporting, whether it be resources uh, at a university or whether it be potentially labor resources or support um, within other organizations, and I would urge everyone to do just that. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Um, all right, let's be a little creative about time management here. Let's bring up, we're going to go to questions next, but let's bring up um, uh, the rest of our panel. Sorry, can you say who you are? Certainly. <laughs> My name is Beth Heyer, um, and I just had a quick question for Dr. Hale. I wonder the extent to which the, the work you did was a little bit of apples and oranges <coughs> since both of the other stations that you, that you compared were um, commercial stations which depend upon ratings to get advertising, that's how they stay in business. And so would their reporting be by definition more sensational? because that's what brings in what generates ratings. I just wondered whether you took that into account in your analysis. Yes, they're different. Um, I mean, I think the bottom line is, yes, one is a commercial entity and, and, and one isn't. I, um, I suppose I do think it's important to, to recognize that, um, that even commercial broadcasters do have a public interest obligation, right? That, that the airways are owned by all of us, and so as a result, they have a, 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 an obligation to provide meaningful news and information. Um, I think generally they fail miserably at that obligation, and I think that the, the, the regulating bodies um, have not stepped up to do that. But yes, I think that the bottom line is they, they do have different um, uh, uh, structures, and that shows up in the news. So. Gary Gelman, let me just follow up. Is there a reason you didn't use My9 or NBC40 to at Atlantic City? Um, uh, there's only so much money. <laughs> we 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 uh, we went for the highest rated. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, the, the the bottom line is that this was what we had the the, the funding and the capacity to do um, uh, at this time, and so what we chose is the st the two stations that are most watched. Um, uh, in New York and, and Philadelphia. I would love to look um, at, at, at My9. We've, we did it a number of years ago, um, but it would be wonderful to take another look and, and in fact, do a, a broader landscape. It's really um, uh, just a question of this is what we had the capacity to do at this time. Okay, Jeff has a question. Uh, I'm, I don't have room to stand up. Uh, I'm Jeff Jarvis from CUNY. My colleague Chris Anderson will be talking about some research that we're doing in New Jersey later. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, from anyone, looking at the next stages of research here. One is audience, how much audience and viewership and listenership we're, we're getting into, into New Jersey to this. And then second is impact. Uh, are, we, are, we, are we, has anyone begun to measure how informed or uninformed New Jerseyans are versus anyone else? And I see Laurie, you're shaking your head. I think that's, that's in many ways the crux of the question. It would be great if we could come back here in a year or two and have a study that looks at impact in terms of, uh, you know, we're making, we're all making kind of a big a bet here that by covering more deeply the issues in New, in New Jersey and having that on New Jersey radio and television that people will uh, will be more informed and will also maybe act, uh, you know, uh, vote and do other things in, in, in greater civic uh, engagement. Um, but we don't know. I mean, in terms of the, the, the ratings, um, we, you know, it's interesting with our New Jersey stations. We don't we get our ratings every because their their diary method for Arbitron. The last ones that we got was spring of 2012. So so it it for us it's actually too early to tell. Um, we see some increase certainly in um, in some of the WNYC. Uh, and, and the the membership is, in some ways, the best, <laughs> because that's about people that are really loyal and really engaged. I, I, I just want to say one other thing about, um, 
it is it has been such a pleasure and uh, um, a privilege in many ways to start thinking about uh, what we can do more here in New Jersey and it would not be possible without and I, I don't really mean to give you know a, a shout out to our funders but I do because the funders are really different here in the sense that they have people like Chris Daggett and Hans Decker and David Haas and um, have a, a vision of what could be and you know there is uh, th there is really um, a, a, and and feather and Ingrid in terms of kind of th they're relentless in their passion for a vision of of uh, a New Jersey news service that really means something and that kind of partnership is frankly few it's really few, very rare it's very rare and I just want to say that. Are there? Donna Liu. Um, I'm interested in hearing from you <coughs> if uh, you could start from scratch and if your newsrooms were not uh, bound to some of the legacy, you know, uh, linear broadcast, et cetera. Uh, how would you, uh, what would you do? How would you, uh, how would you shape public media? Would the role of the public be the same as it has been, you know, traditionally. Um, I, I just, I know it's a very broad question, but I'd like to hear I what you have to say. I might jump in with that because we did basically start from scratch a year, a ha year and a half ago, and through some, you know, great uh, um, forward thinking by John Servideo and, and Neil Shapiro, my bosses, you know, we, we had decided to go ahead in a, with the capacity that we had for funding, but to use uh, the latest technology, to use the internet as best we could, to use partnerships to create a new way to cover news. And uh, you know, we're, we're delighted to hear the results that both uh, Patrick and, and Matthew brought forward today. Uh, you know, we're very gratified by that because I think it bears out what we've done in the past uh, year and a half. Um, you know, we've, we've had to do this, <laughs> excuse me, we've, we've got, as Neil said before, we've got cameras at uh, seven universities and the, and the Star Ledger. Um, and uh, the State House, and we're ever increasing, looking to ever increase that. Um, these are the kinds of cameras and technology that local news does not use. Um, they're, I wouldn't say stuck with the old technology because mi microwave and satellite is great for live um, you know, reporting, but we, we're using the new cellular equipment, and uh, you know, we've been able to take a fresh start from what uh, the, the commercial stations have done all along. And um, I, I think it's been much to our benefit. So um, at this point, you know, we're sort of the experiment in starting from scratch, I think. I'd add one quick thing, just an example of a difference. Because we have this relationship with the universities, one of the series we're most proud of is something called NJ Docs. And it's, um, it's a series of documentaries done by students that we curate, but they go right on television. I think if I were a student, what a great thing to say that my project was seen not just by my friends and family in my class, but was seen all across the state. Also, um, if I could say, to the point of WHYY, to a degree, we had started making um, that transition to looking at ourselves as a public media journalism organization as opposed to a broadcaster, even before the New Jersey thing happened. So in terms of what we're doing in New Jersey with Newsworks, <laughs> Newsworks is designed to be a, a news service on social media and a web platform that could exist whether or not we had a radio station. It's interwoven with the radio station, the radio reporting <clears throat> is a strength and adds reach to what we do, but at least half, if not more than half, of what's on Newsworks is for the web or for social media. It's not for radio at all. And essentially, the strategy we took in New Jersey, we didn't add any radio reporters, but we started doing a New Jersey news mini site using <coughs> basically web journalism techniques. Better. I just want to ask this while Matt is still here, because I think, didn't you say you were heading out? Um, I was just skimming the New Jersey. Oh, I'm sorry, Feather Houston uh, Winco Foundation. Um, I, <laughs> well, I go way back. Um, my, my question just is from a brief look at the New Jersey News com uh, Commons, and I, I understand it's very new. Um, just barely getting off the ground. But um, one of the things that's very, very striking is you just look at it is that most of the articles come from NewJersey.com, and when you, when you link in, they're coming from the Star-Ledger. And 
I guess I'm, I'm sort of asking sort of the existential question about uh, where are we really getting all of our news, um, e even in this digital platform, and w what portion of what we would want to know about in a public accountability journalism um, are we like, should we should aspire to, to be able to protect um, if we see continuing decline in, in, in the resources in our print media? In my assessment of just looking at the at the yeah, website. Yeah, that's a temporary uh, technical thing that's being worked on. Yeah. Well, but I but a lot of it but is new. It, yeah. Well, I think I think it's a great question, and I think frankly it, it hits to the overall point of the New Jersey News Commons. Um, ultimately, um, whether it be through our website, whether it be through the daily emails that we're going to push out showcasing the work of New Jersey, um, whether it be the repost, um, we have a repost initiative uh, in terms of collaborative sharing of, of, of uh, content. Um, there are a variety of priorities that, that, that we have for the uh, New Jersey News Commons. Your, re your reference as it relates to um, what we curate and showcase uh, each, each morning. Um, while I definitely would want to take a look at, at what you have, it, it's one of you know five or six main priorities that ultimately hope to just increase the collaborative nature of how we gather news and how we read the news. Um, so I, again, I'd, I'd want to look directly, and I'll be happy to talk to you offline or talk to you uh, in person um, at some point about it. But but I think you know for us, what we want, what we care most about at the center what we care most about at the school and what we're doing with the New Jersey uh, uh, News Commons is to simply try to find er areas and efforts in which uh, collaboration can be created. But I would also add a lot of the collaboration um, isn't necessarily going to come from the Commons. It's not necessarily going to come from the center. It's going to come from the many media entities that are here today and that are leading the charge. We just want to simply be a supportive mechanism. If, if Laura Walker or Jim needs something um, at NJPR, we want to be there for them. And in, in any capacity, just as many of you do as well. And, and that's really our mandate more than anything else. It's not to necessarily um, dictate or lead. It's really to support and assist. And I, I think this uh, question about news origination is going to come up on the, it's going to be addressed on the third panel. I want to make sure, yeah, I was just going to go come to you, Jim, and you, you'll say what you want to say, but I also want to set you and, and Chris up on this question. Um, something Laura had mentioned, which was data journalism, um, so, so my question is, um, how do you think about the relative balance between sort of reporting in terms of staffing and other resources between kind of old-fashioned reporting and um, data journalism, or is that even a distinction that's worth making anymore? Well, I think that I'm going to speak to what Feather said first, and I think they're, they're related. Okay. And nice to see you. It's been a long time. Um, uh, I think I think you're, you've gone to the heart of the matter with your question, and uh, this is going to sound old-fashioned and probably uh, has a special pleading quality to it. But uh, uh, without journalists, there's not going to be uh, a lot of journalism. And I think that the the uh, uh, the the most worrisome thing for a community is is the the lack of reporting. I would say, and this is something Jeff and I have talked about a lot in, in different settings, uh, that the, uh, uh, the hopes and dreams of, of what uh, non-professionals, well-meaning citizen journalists, whatever sort of term you want to apply to it, can do without guidance structure from people who have a lot of experience in finding out stuff that people don't want known which is what I think the highest calling of journalism is, uh, is, is pretty limited. So that uh, the continuing uh, disinvestment because of market forces, if we can't find ways to counter it, uh, we will have less journalism. And in a place like, like uh, New Jersey with what's the number, 650 municipalities, mm -hmm. Uh, are and start start adding in garbage districts and sanitation right. districts and 
joint juncture commissions and so on, it, it proliferates. Uh, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of places for bad stuff to happen, and we have a grand and glorious history of it happening here. <laughs> and that, that, that I, I don't think that there's any uh, less of it uh, than, than there was 25 years ago. I suspect we know about less of it than we did 25 years ago. So the, the, the single most important thing we can do is uh, figure out how to, how to pay for more journalism. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that, that we, through the help of people in this room, are in the process. We're about to hire two people. As, 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 as Laura said, it's, that's 100% growth in our, in our uh, New Jersey staffing. That's not going to get the job done, but it's going to go in the right direction. Uh, in terms of, of the question that, that, that you just posed, the, uh, we're, I'm hoping that one of those two people is, the, the person I have my eye on is somebody who has a lot of data journalism experience, uh, but who is, I think, would probably come across to the audience as a, a, a traditional investigative storyteller, but she's got these tools in, at, at her disposal. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know, maybe there are people, who, there, there are lots of different kinds of consumers of news. Most people, even in a time of, of high unemployment, I know we have the highest in the country in our state, another thing we can be uh, proud of, that um, even in a time of unemployment, I think people, t people's time is dear, and that refining information to where they can, where people can read it as a story and not have to pick it out from a table is, is, is finishing the job. Mm -hmm. So the data journalism I think of as a tool, I think we have to constantly be upgrading our newsrooms, uh, uh, newsrooms plural, ability to do it. Uh, we're, we're, it's another thing we're growing at, at, at WNYC and that resource will be available to NJPR. I, I, I like to think that we, we, need to just, we need to hire numerate uh, sophisticated reporters who, who, who have the tool. An, an, another thing, the, the other uh, position that we're hiring for, um, well, between the two positions, I think something that the state needs and that I hope we'll be able to contribute toward. So we, we need um, uh, uh, diverse reporting teams who are attentive to a diverse range of issues. And I'm, I'm committed in the hiring I get to do to uh, continuing what's been an effort at w WNYC over a long period of time to have a very, very diverse newsroom. This is a very complicated state. And if, uh, if everybody who I have working here looks like me, I'm not going to find out things, again, things that I don't know and that, and that we all need to know. Chris? Chris, did you? I'm tempted to say what Jim said. But, okay. uh, <laughs> one point I make is that um, in terms of digital journalism, there is uh, a new skill set, essentially a new job in doing data visualization journalism um, online. And it takes a set of skills that's different, um, definitely from uh, broadcast storytelling and different from newspaper graphics. And uh, that job only began to be a job within the last, I don't know, six or seven years. So it is improbable that something that started out as a radio newsroom is going to have anybody with those skills. So it takes some time to develop them. We actually have somebody on our web staff who is extraordinarily good at this. He's also our lead designer. He's our lead coder. He's the health and science web producer, and he takes a turn on the home page, and he has three children under the age of six, which he and his wife homeschool. So, um, though I have him working that on two... sounds like three more data journalists. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 we're, going to bring, we're going to bring them up in the grand tradition. So he is... He is working on two really fascinating um, data-driven projects that we're doing right now, but they don't come as fast as you'd like just because everybody is multitasking. And this is hard stuff. To do it well and make it really sing is not easy. Um, and it takes a lot of technical skill, and uh, you know, not a lot of newsrooms have that. Mike? We're going to keep you busy. We're just going to keep peppering oh. questions. Right. My name is Susan uh, Haig. Hi, I'm Susan Haig, uh, New Jersey Arts News. Thank you, Kira, for um, putting our story on the front page yesterday. We're delighted. We're uh, uh, part of the partnership with um, both NJTV and, and 
uh, WHYY. And I'm, I'm really thrilled by the collaborative momentum. It's, it's because of what it means altogether for New Jersey, it means it would outweigh any um, individual news provider from, uh, from the, cult from the uh, commercial side. My question, I think it's for Chris, mostly. Um, is there, it, it seems to me that with all the, um, the news that we get, there's, there's conventions of news that it's structured basically in looking at the world as partisan and looking at the world as quantitative. And, and news is difficult, and it seems that there's more and more and more of that. <laughs> and less and less of what I would call the civic cultural that assumes that citizens are creative, that citizens are the self-governors, um, that citizens are the ones that are, are eventually going to drive change. So I just wonder if any of you, with the daily rat race that you're in, actually have time to deliberately set aside space for that civic cultural kind of storytelling that tends to get pushed aside in the wake of the day-to-day -day rat race of politics and money. Uh, well, so it's part of my title, so I guess I, sh I should yeah. know. I mean, it's, it's sort of been who I've been as a journalist for a long time, but you're absolutely right that it is um, a process of, of fighting uphill in the average newsroom because there's certain sort of deep structures that most journalists understand. You know, when they say this is a good story, usually they mean people are yelling at each other. Um, and if they say this is a boring story, it means the civic life is going well. Um, but, um, you know, for a long time at the Enquirer before this and, and now at WHYY, we've, you know, we've a been able to at least carve out a space where um, the notion of um, journalism is let's find where things are going well and see if we can spread that magic. And we've been working with, uh, in the WHYY newsroom for about the last six months, we've been working sporadically with David Bornstein, who writes the fixes. Uh, blog for the New York Times on, I can't remember what the latest name of it is, but it's sort of the Center for Solutions Journalism. And David has come and worked with our staff a little bit. And I, I'm noticing that now, after browbeating by me, a number of our um, reporters, when they're pitching a story, going, and Chris, this is the solutions piece. So, you know, progress is slow and halting, but there is some. Uh, I would, can I add to that as well? I think that the... Um, uh, we, I, was, I was just editing our, our Peabody entry uh, late last night because, of course, it's due today. Um, uh, uh, I guess I uh, missed that deadline. About, oops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about, about our Sandy coverage. And uh, the, words, the, the word that the guy who wrote it put in the, in the uh, first paragraph was that WNYC served as a hearth for the community uh, during and after the storm. And then the first, the, the next paragraph uh, quoted a, a line from Brian Lehrer from about nine o'clock that Monday night, where he said, uh, "We're here. We're going to ride it out with you." And uh, it was absolutely eye-opening to me when I came to WNYC and uh, in, in JPR from the Times a few months ago, the role that 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 radio, and I, I, I suspect that, that, that TV, when it's on, plays uh, in, in moments like that. And uh, so that I think, I think that that responsibility to, to recognize that we are uh, an integral part of the community is much more a part of the culture and the awareness of where I work now than where I worked before. Uh, I have nothing negative to say about the New York Times. It's just not part of the, the identity of the place. Uh, that said, uh, I, I, don't, I don't personally believe that, uh, and I don't think this is what you're saying, I'm, I'm twisting your words a bit, that if, if we conducted a, a radio station and a website and a social media enterprise that was all about kumbaya moments, I don't think that we'd be doing our job, and I don't think that uh, we'd have a very large audience, because you do need to bring people's attention to what the civic polity needs to act on. I think that that's... That, that's so central, but, but as you can do that in a way that is not um, uh, quarrelsome. I will say this, I, our, our, our metro editor, longtime WNYC correspondent named Andrea Bernstein, who a lot of you I'm sure have, have heard on the radio, told me that her first job at WNYC was co-hosting a talk show with Curtis Sliwa. So clearly over time there have been different ways to, to serve as the hearth. Uh, but I, I, would, I would say that, that, that Brian Lehrer and our, and our news team now have a, a conception that's not that distant from what you're probably hoping for. Yeah, I, I would hasten to 
to just correct the, the notion that, 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 that civic humanities means kumbaya because really it's, it's absolutely the heart of what we are as a democracy. It's the urgencies of citizens being empowered to build communities and recognizing the value of them as creators and builders instead of their value as consumers. It seems to me the consumer model has way taken over <coughs> and that public media often falls play to that. And I think for the researchers, it would be fascinating to use as your criteria going forward what, what percentage of stories are essentially quantitative, what are kind of about business and money. Also, what percentage are, are, are politically, are partisan structured, where you assume somebody's on one side or the other, rather than talking about us as the whole. And third, the percentage of, of talkers um, that are the, the gender balance and the ethnic balance and those who are interviewed. I think they're just such a, rich, a richness in New Jersey of, of civic leaders, of educational leaders. I would love to hear from more university deans, university professors, um, builders of communities, smart growth people. I just think there's a great, great range in the civic cultural area. So it really, to me, is the, is the, is the urgency of our society rather than the kind of sweetness and light. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Pat, um, let me get to your question one second. I just want to, because I want to bring John into into the discussion. So I'm going to ask a, a general question. Maybe John, you could take a first shot at it, and then we'll go to you, Patrick, um, about money. Um, so the the Pew Center for Excellence in Journalism notes that a lot of the new digital um, non commercial startups are reaching an inflection point where they have to be much more um, sophisticated and develop multiple revenue streams. And of course, public broadcasting is sort of ahead in this. Um, in this game that others have joined uh, in terms of having those multiple revenue streams and yet, as Kira notes, you know, are playing catch up um, uh, with the loss of um, government revenue. So my question is, you know, as you think about different business models and we're aware of, you know, a number that are out there including paywalls and, you know, payment for deep dive for data, um, deep dive data, you know, how do you think about those possibilities uh, in relationship to public media's mission? And are there some business models that you just can't go to, even though they'd be legally permissible because <laughs> it's just not in the spirit of public media? Um, and are there new ones that are promising? Well, I, I, I can tell you generally, I, I, my past history before I got to WNET and NJTV comes from a for-profit <coughs> world, so it took me a little time to understand <coughs> the mission aspect of public television. And I can tell you that um, under Neil, WNET generally really is very serious about how they look upon, how they get the money, how the underwriting comes in, the spots, the fundraising. So I think as uh, public media in general, but certainly NJTV specifically, we really do watch and look at how we're able to do that. We're very sensitive to how we not only give the news on NJ today, we're also sensitive on, on who we have on the show to make sure that there's no type of um, um, things that could be looked upon wrong. So uh, in terms of the new technologies, in terms of raising money, obviously we're very concerned and we are very involved in the traditional, the underwriting the spots and the traditional fundraising. But I think there's new technologies that are always being spoken about, whether they're through the, iPhone, you know, through the phone, uh, which I think um, is a big part of it. And there's also, I've, I'm a firm believer in one-on-one -on -one type of relationships type of thing. I think events are a big deal for our fundraising. I think technology obviously is something we all look to for the future and, and for the present. But I'm a firm believer in events and be able to get people together and speak about what you do and meet people and in that way just develop relationships. And I, to me, for NJTV, I think that's the future for us at least over the next year or two. Alan, if I could just uh, kind of give one example on this. I mean, we're constantly thinking of new sources of revenue, new things to do, but within who we are. So you're all aware of, you know, all of the underwriting that we have on radio. And what we put on the air, as you all probably know, is governed by the FCC. There's very strict rules about what you say on the air. But as I mentioned, we started Newsworks. Uh, and so we've got this web platform, which is not regulated by the FCC. So you could put tons of pricing information on there. You could have these wild calls to action. Um, but you have to be mindful of who you are you know, and what, what people are looking for you for. So we do have these discussions internally when our underwriting folks bring us something for the web that we would not put on the, on the radio, but, you know, can we put it on the web because blah, blah, blah. But, but you have to step back and say, 
you know, people have expectations of us, you know, who we are, what's our DNA, and that's really what limits us um, and, and what we have to constantly be mindful of. I would just add one thing. I think there are a couple of real lines that there cannot be any real or perceived sense of editorial control. I mean, that is, I think, you know, um, uh, very, very clear in our minds that we're not going to cross that line. I think our, the, but I do think that there are other sources of revenue we can be looking at. And I, I think the diversified revenue base, I think, is really our strength. The combination of membership, trying to figure out how to, you know, drive membership in a digital age is, is one of our key business challenges and and also opportunities because there's lots and lots of people listening participating watching on uh, digitally and how do you draw, you know drive that membership it is by and this is I think the other piece that uh, the membership piece makes you ask how do I create how do we every day create some you know stories and other things that um, people are gonna be so loyal to and so deeply moved by that they're going to pay for something they get for free. Um, and, you know, that is a really good uh, kind of uh, goal to have uh, every day. And that keeps us not only honest, it keeps uh, kind of moving the bar up. Patrick, did you, you, you skip a question? Okay. Other questions? Can I answer feathers again? <laughs> uh, Jeff Jarvis again. Um, yeah, I'll say this very I think I think key to your question is about how many, how large the ecosystem of news does to be in New Jersey. And I think that we cannot think that it's arrived. We lived in an era where we had one big paper, and that was the ecosystem of news. Now we have many, many, many players, and part of the goal of the Commons is to encourage not only those who exist today, but to set the circumstances so that you can have many, many more players coming in, contributing news of all sorts. So spotlight growing, a lot of barista nets, a lot of specialists around, and that ecosystem as a whole then grows, giving more material to the professionals to work with, more help from the professionals to them, as Jim said. Uh, but that's gotta be a key goal from this point forward. If this is the first check to say, how are we doing with the known outlets? I would argue that the next phase of development should be to create more and more outlets. David and then Ingrid. And Ingrid, you'll have the last word and then you'll come up and. Okay, all right. <laughs> Just made it. Okay. Uh, David Haas, Wincote Foundation and William Penn Foundation. Um, oh, geez, I lost it. From these things. I'm not good at the. All right, I have, a, I have a, a comment and a question. To, uh, the comment uh, is I think everyone is familiar with the. The State Impact Project of NPR, which is uh, focused on, uh, I, I, I hear it's a sort of prototype eight states, including Pennsylvania, not New Jersey, so, uh, but uh, the notion being to really have a deep focus on journalism in these states on a particular topic. The three uh, areas are education, uh, energy, and, the, and environment, so Pennsylvania, of course, is in the energy field. And again, this is not about New Jersey, but I guess it's a su suggestion to think of this being New Jersey, but also part of that bigger space, because this is a major effort. Um, HYY, to its great credit, has some terrific reporters that were already doing this on, on Marcellus Shale, which is why they chose us for energy. And I just think, think about that as you do it, because you have funders, particularly uh, OSF, that particularly care about engaging states on, on policy issues. So it's just a, a comment. Um, then the question, I wanted to go back to the data question. Um, you know, we fund uh, the uh, um, uh, Center for Pub Public Integrity, um, in particular, in this case, for their partnerships with regionals. So they do the big data, and then they, it, it, they look to several, they also work with the Times and everyone else, but they look for regional uh, journalism to uh, cover that. Um, so I guess the question about data, and I'm not quite sure exactly what data journalism is, but the way we see it is these massive uh, sets of data that uh, apply to a certain key issue, and uh, somebody needs to organize it, and smaller entities can't. In particular, I would, I would point out sort of the, uh, I call it the state corruption index, mm -hmm. which is actually the state integrity index, but um, <laughs> it's actually a great project because it's a national 
uh, in this case, uh, a thing with a model, and then each state is uh, covered. It gives information. So I guess I'm not sure what uh, data. I think foundations, if they can behave them, it'd be, would be interested in funding data and research if it's good. I'm not sure that uh, uh, the entities alone should do it. And what's just one little, uh, I think if everyone knows this, the great story is that New Jersey was at the top. Yes. <laughs> and in part because it had been so bad that there is more uh, attention paid to uh, regulations than actually following them. But, so the question about data, how much should a news organization create data and how much should be t gathered from elsewhere and maybe other supporters uh, from a public interest might, might support that. Are, are, we, are we ahead of Nigeria? Was it just states in the United just States? States. <laughs> just states. Of the 50 states. Of the 50 it was states. the quality of laws. Okay. It wasn't the quality of behavior. Oh, oh I'm sorry. It was, yeah. 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 Um, it was actually a set of uh, criteria. Right. 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 And, and David's exactly right. The reason why New Jersey was ranked best in terms of laws is that it had so much recent spectacular corruption and selling of kidneys and all that that right. um, it had good laws. Local ethics laws, which right. are terrible. In the I understand. So. The, the, I, I, there's so many. There's so much in your question, David, to, to to unpack. I think about some of the things that that we're doing. The the uh, I was I was just down to the Center for Public Integrity talking to uh, to Ellen Weiss about the the massive work that they've done on Medicare uh, uh, costs and spending and so on, and trying to figure out what if there was a, a slice of it that WNYC could work with them on. And they're st they've been at it for about a year and a half, and they're still trying to make sense of the database in many ways and haven't gotten down to that level, which is a, a measure of the challenge. At the same time, uh, uh, when you do get the right data, there's a lot that you can do. WNYC, before I arrived, played a very big role in identifying stop and frisk uh, conduct by the New York Police Department as an issue in in the city, and it's, it's a story that transcends the borders of New York, and that was through the work of our our data news team, uh, led by John Keefe, working with a more traditional reporter who had who was an attorney and had a tremendous amount of skill. So the the uh, all kinds of reporting together helped lay out the story, driven by data of of what the NYPD was doing. We're now working with ProPublica in the aftermath of Sandy to try and you, 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 you pose the question, should, should news organizations create the data? Uh, well, there, there's a kind of data that you, 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 you can create. We're trying to figure out how to collect data on, together on people's applications for FEMA aid and SBA loans in order to be able to, to track uh, both the performance of the government and the uh, uh, the the value that the that the aid returns the the, the tradition I, I was speaking with a great New Jersey journalist named Gil Gall who lives in Cherry Hill and uh, I worked with very briefly at the Times he's he's won the Pulitzer Prize a number of times uh, not least for his coverage of of uh, beach rebuilding and he says the pattern is this there's there's a disaster there's a hurricane the money floods in. Uh, it gets wasted, stolen to a significant degree. Policy doesn't change, and about three years later, journalists come and find a GAO report and write about uh, what a mess it was. We're trying to speed up the timeline to maybe <laughs> catch, catch it while it's happening. Okay. But there's work to be done. I, I think I'm going to make a transition, ask my question while a couple of people leave to get on a train. And uh, so if uh, Alara and Neil want to leave, and we'll thank them, I will ask if next year when we come together, if we could talk about, about another side of public media, and that is what we all love, a Charlie Rose, a Terry Gross, that's not news, but it helps people learn about things, think about things, and we don't have a voice in New Jersey uh, that would elicit the other voices of New Jersey in that kind of format. And so how do you get something like that? Is it the, the executive or the news staff? But that's what's missing, in, I think, in New Jersey, is getting a sense of who we are by listening to other people ask questions and bring interesting things to us. So I'm putting it on the table for next year. Uh, and, uh, and saying thank you uh, to you. And maybe we can sort of think about that. The other thing I want to say while they're leaving thank is... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey. 
there are a lot of people who are already involved in this, and it would be fun to uh, note them. But for you who are still here, before we close, if you're willing, we'd like to know what you think the needs are in New Jersey for being addressed by our, our public media and how we collaborate, and what you personally would want. We're going to put those on the table. So think about it. If you're willing, you can contribute to the list. In some sense, this panel is one that was considered new since we met in Camden and got to talking about what we wanted in, um, in our public media. But it actually was anticipated back when the, the contracts were written. I thought you might be interested to know that the letter that went from the treasurer to the stations that acquired the stations uh, and our public media said that this move would create a stronger overall programming schedule for New Jersey-centric public affairs programming. And it would do that through expansion of staff assigned to the creation of New Jersey-centric programming and the creation of a New Jersey news cooperative. And I think at that time, there were maybe some people who had ideas of what that might be, but there certainly weren't specific um, structures laid out, an organization chart, uh, even uh, a, a sense of who would do it. So I thought it was interesting that even though today I think we think it's an, uh, still an experimental concept, it was there from the beginning. And I don't know who put it in there, and I'm not going to ask. But it is a part of what we're talking about now because we are trying to fulfill that mission, I think, of increased programming and New Jersey-centric news. So I am delighted that we have a panel that can give us some more insight, even though we've been talking about this a lot already. Uh, and so I, I, I hope that we can get into some of the how you were doing it and what you would like to see happen. But I'd like to call on Molly Aguiar first uh, from the Dodge Foundation because um, uh, uh, Chris Daggett's gotten a lot of credit for, <laughs> for starting this, raising the money and so on. And Molly, you've been on the ground for a long time. And I thought maybe we'd let you uh, say what it was like in the beginning and what you see happening and sort of what are the three things that we should take from this collaboration. Uh, then I'm going to call on John Mooney because John Mooney is living it. And I have to say that I have sort of a conflict of interest here because uh, John Mooney is doing a great job running NJ Spotlight, but I happen to chair the board of NJ Spotlight, so I'm supposed to say that. But, uh, <laughs> but even if I wasn't, I would. But I, I think that, um, John, it would be interesting to hear from you because I think when you started, you didn't think that you'd be collaborating uh, uh, as a part of your whole framework of how Spotlight was going to work, how it was going to raise money, how it was going to be known. And so uh, I thought maybe you could sort of give us some insights on what it means to be a collaborator, okay? And, um, and then I, <clears throat> I'd like to turn to the new team uh, on the block. Uh, we ask about research. That's what universities should be doing. And we'd like to turn to Chris Anderson and Kathleen McCullough, uh, 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 Chris has had experience with looking at the media ecosystem, is that right? Yep. Okay. You can ask him what it is, I'm not going to ask him, um, uh, of having done this in one place. And it's now being done in New Jersey. And so I think in a year from now, if we really do this again, uh, you'll have some results. But I think it's important to say why you're doing it and uh, what you think we might learn from the results of this, uh, this research. So Molly, give us a sense of what this is all about. You were there on the ground and you're watching it now and raising money for it. That's true. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Molly De Aguiar. I'm the Director of Communications and Media Grant Making at the Dodge Foundation. And um, if there's anyone in the audience that doesn't know about the Dodge Foundation, we are the largest uh, private fund foundation in New Jersey focused exclusively on New Jersey. We have um, pro four main program areas in the arts, education, environment, and media. 
Um, media, we have, we have historically always given to media, um, public media, since the beginning, but I wouldn't say that it was a major focus of ours. Um, about three years ago, not quite three years ago, when Chris Daggett came to Dodge, he brought a vision for media that was different than we had had before, based on his uh, lifelong dedication to public service and his belief and commitment in the democratic process. And so um, not long after he arrived, we, uh, along with the uh, William Penn Foundation and the Fund for New Jersey and the Community Foundation of New Jersey, uh, put together a conference. Many, many of the people who are in the room were, today were, were there. That was in the fall of 2010, I believe. And we wanted to talk about, um, we wanted to talk about the challenges and the opportunities for the future and how we could rethink um, the media landscape in New Jersey and um, what it was going to take to strengthen the ecosystem, as Jeff said, um, and Jeff was there as well. And out of that conference, uh, a, an idea emerged about the state, statewide news collaborative effort. And um, the way that it took shape uh, immediately following the conference is, is uh, she, uh, she left, but Laura Walker came to us and said, we like this idea, we're willing to step up and take a leadership role in Montclair State as well. So we put together a partnership with WNYC and Montclair State University. We give uh, two major grants to them to do this work. Um, you, you heard it before, they, they sort of spelled out what their roles are, but um, WNYC is New Jersey Public Radio is basically our lead editorial partner, um, and they are also working on their collaborations um, and part new partnerships here in the state. Um, and then Montclair State is, I think somebody mentioned it as, or described it as a hub, and I think that's okay. a really accurate way of describing it. So they, they have a number of different roles that they play at Montclair State. They, um, they have the Center for Cooperative Media, as Matthew discussed. It's, uh, it's the physical space on campus where there's the shared newsroom, the shared studios, um, and a chance for the people to come together in person and, and collaborate. And then there's also the NJ News Commons, which, is, which occupies more of a digital space, and that's headed by Debbie Gallant. And I wish she were here because she's a really um, a terrific leader of this effort. So. Um, I want to address what Feather asked about earlier because um, what Debbie does on a daily basis, and I, I'm a big fan of this, and I would recommend that anybody um, sign up who's not signed up, but she sends out a daily uh, email that curates the best headlines um, from around the state. So it's not just NJ.com or the Star Ledger. She really makes a concerted effort to find all the different sources, and, and because of her background with BaristaNet, she is really familiar with all the hyperlocals in New Jersey, and there are quite a lot of them. And so she, she sort of frames the story of the day, and then she fills in those blanks with a, a lot of the different headlines from around the state. And it's a, it's a terrific newsletter. She does a great job with it. Um, and also, the, the, one of the roles of her doing that is um, to, to bring um, notice to the actual, uh, to the media organizations here in New Jersey, um, the, the learning opportunities that are available. And she also puts together um, training opportunities and um, any, any type of uh, resources that Montclair State can bring to the ecosystem, her, that's her role. And she's sort of the, the chief cheerleader for the ecosystem. So um, they, they do a terrific job there. And um, I think we've made a remarkable amount of progress in the past year. And that um, between those two partners, plus all of our other partners, like NJ Spotlight and WBGO and WHYY, you know, the, we have multiple ones, NJ Arts News. Um, you know, our media grants are, are by design meant to feed into this system of how are we going to strengthen the New Jersey ecosystem? How are we going to, um, how are we going to get the public informed and engaged and participating in community decision making? And um, so that's, 
that's the genesis of it. Um, you asked me three, three things we t I take away from this. So one of the things that we um, haven't really talked about much today, I don't think, that I think is a really exciting opportunity is um, around sort of those government 2.0 um, opportunities where you can work directly with the communities in New Jersey, the municipalities, and you can work with um, the local elected officials there to talk about what are the community information needs and how can municipalities do a better job informing and engaging the communities. And so um, I think there's some really big opportunities there that we're looking into and um, trying to do to uh, lead that effort this year. Um, and there are a lot of really exciting, creative um, civic innovation tools that are out there. The Knight Foundation is a really big supporter of those kinds of tools. Um, and maybe we can bring some of those to New Jersey to help the efforts. Um, and I think one of the big challenges is um, how, do we, how, do we get the, how do we get the public to understand what's avail what information is available to them. How do we drive the traffic to the, to the sites and to TV and to radio so that they know that it's there? So, um, the marketing. We, we haven't the marketing, really used it's, that it's, word today. Right. So those are, those are the three that I would uh, highlight. Um, and we have a lot of opportunities around Hurricane Sandy, too, that we, um, we received a grant from the Knight Foundation to put together what we're calling the Hurricane Sandy Inform and Engage Fund. And uh, we don't have those guidelines publicly available yet, but they're coming. And it's all around all the things that we've been talking about today. It's about accountability reporting. It's about um, uh, increased community information sharing um, in, at the municipal level. It's about ongoing coverage of Hurricane Sandy-related issues. Um, so keep an eye out for that. That news is coming pretty soon. Okay, so we're up to date. John, what does it look like to, to be a collaborator? Well, let, me, let me first say, um, Ingrid, in introducing us, said uh, she, she felt compelled to say that she's our chairperson. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that I remind people as often as I can that Ingrid is our chairperson. <laughs> Um, she is a, a, a wonderful force in the state and, and has done tremendously. Uh, and you asked, you know, what was I thinking about collaboration when NJ Spotlight started? And I, I, I wondered, what was I thinking in general uh, when NJ Spotlight started? But let me give you a little background for those of you who don't, um, who don't know about us. We started, uh, basically, uh, we're mostly refugees from print. Uh, we... Uh, most of us left the Star Ledger in, in 2008 in the Great Exodus, and uh, it took a year or so to pull it together. But there were a couple of us who were very interested in, in keeping alive sustainable or keeping alive public affairs reporting, and uh, we were very lucky to run into Ingrid, who was very interested from a foundation point of view to keep alive public affairs reporting. And so we 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 launched it uh, in in May of 2010. Uh, with a couple reporters and, and you know our kitchens and, and rest stops and wherever else we could uh, put together our product and have have grown we're now about eight eight or so folks who are working full or, or a lot of part time um, we, we don't call ourselves necessarily a startup anymore but we we feel like it uh, in, in, in a lot of ways and we think have made a have made a mark in in the state in really providing substantive journalism uh, in areas especially around education, healthcare, public finance, energy and environment, sort of our core issues. And, and we very much have focused on those. Um, somebody asked us, are you innovative? And I said, actually focusing on substantive uh, public affairs issues is almost innovative in these times, um, <laughs> especially in terms of object objective journalism. And I think we've, we've, we've really shown that and, and very proud of what we've done. Uh, in terms of collaboration, it, it became readily apparent pretty quickly in our in our life that we couldn't do this alone, and we had to reach out to others, um, and in many ways, um, and and certainly in terms of audience building, we have worked with um, one of the very first contracts we signed, and it was a little scary because you know signing any contract at that point it's sort of like that that first act, but it was Philly.com, um, and I don't think we've we've ever renewed it, but we continue to be a a, a place on there. New Jer or their South Jersey page, which is a big driver of uh, traffic for us. And it was those kinds of things that slowly started building. Um, and, and then Patch, where they started picking up our stuff. 
you know, more than, in, in some ways, more than we wanted. Um, not so much in, in the individual pickups, but they were starting to pick up our entire stories, and so that, that came with its perils. But, but getting it out there, um, those kinds of, it, it became very apparent that people weren't necessarily going to come to us. We had to find ways to go to them. Um, and, and, and that, you know, we have our own ways of doing it, and we can talk a lot about social media and marketing and some of the tools that, that we really feel very strongly about. Um, but it, it's getting into other people's listservs. It was getting into folks' conversations, uh, digital and otherwise, and that was very important to us. Um, also was the issue of, of, of partnering for content, and we did that. Um, we're working on it. We did a project with Patch early on on charter schools in the suburbs. Uh, we're doing a project now with WNYC uh, around a school in Newark and following that over the course of the year. And those are the kinds of content building that I think that the partnerships really lend themselves to. But it's also being on their shows and them being in, in, in our place. I, I find when I do a, do a segment with WHYY, which we do on a weekly basis, that segment, that half hour, we put it up as a podcast, but I think that's part of the storytelling. I think that's an important piece of journalism. It's changing in that way. Uh, we certainly have done it with our voters guide. We didn't talk about that, but we built a voters guide and, and have used it to get, get the um, you know, some really hardcore, substantive stuff about every single race in the state out, and we've used, we've allowed widgets to be used on different websites. Thank and you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but being in those segments, that's as much content now in journalism as writing that long opus, uh, and I think it's very important to do that. And then the last but not least is events and, and roundtable discussions and forums, and we've done 13 now, is that about right? Uh, around different things from charter schools to solar energy where we bring folks together to talk about them. And again, have that discussion. That to me is journalism. That's civic journalism, but I think that's as valuable content as any. And those are all happening because of collaboration. And, uh, and it's, yes, I was not thinking a whole lot about it back then. <laughs> um, but now it's, it's central to our mission. It's in a very short period of time. Does this work in reverse? John mentioned the voter guide. Um, I just did a little study of four newspapers and what they covered in the election. None of them covered the congressional races. And I was thinking to myself, does Debbie look at the newspapers? Does she notice that the newspapers aren't doing anything on congressional races? And does she call up somebody and say, Spotlight did the voter guide. Why don't you just use that material? I mean, how do we identify in the, in the going in the other direction the deficiencies that are out there and with what Debbie, or a person like Debbie would know about what Spotlight is doing, what other people are doing is is do the salesman work of saying, you know, you want to do this, you want to buy this product. Uh, is, is that a potential in, in this game? Yeah, I think that's very much I mean, you do it yourself, yeah, John. We, we <laughs> remind people what they don't run of ours all the time. Um, <laughs> and it's, no, there's, there's no doubt that um, it, it, it's back to this point. We have to go to them. Right. Um, and it's not just going to readers, but it's going to news outlets. It's going right. to partners. Yeah. Um, and reminding them on a daily basis um, that we have... And, and others, it's not just us, that, mm -hmm. that there are, because there's so much, there's, there is, you know, the, the big issue is there is a ton of information out there. And I don't think there's a shortage of news, certainly, in these, in these days. And, and we have this conversation all the time about Chris Christie. Um, think, you know, love him or hate him for his politics, he is wonderful for New Jersey Spotlight. <laughs> um, and he is wonderful for news in this state. He makes news every day. And um, so the, the news is out there, but it's a way of getting it covered. And I, am, I feel pers perfectly satisfied that HYY or NYC is covering an issue mm -hmm. uh, that we may miss because it's getting covered. I mm -hmm. think that's a central piece. And, and what we want to do at Spotlight and, and others are doing is, is filling in those gaps of things that aren't getting covered. Mm -hmm. And that means it's actively marketing. It's, marketing is different now than it used to be. Um, but it is actively taking your, your items and, and getting them into mailboxes, getting them on listservs, getting them into conversations as best you can. Let me ask the news directors, do you, would you buy the stuff? Do you buy the stuff if somebody comes to you and says, hey, wait a minute, here's something that you haven't covered. Here's the story. You don't have to do the journalism part. It's been done. Does that happen? Well, I, I, I think we go out and do the journalism again to be sure that it's right and mm -hmm. good and done properly. But you, oh, except the idea. But we, we would do that often, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that how NewsWorks works, Chris? Well, I mean, we establish partnerships with people, and um, we won't get into the details, but there is an exchange of value between WHYY <laughs> and, <laughs> and the spotlight. Um, you know, you prefer to do things yourself, but your, your bigger 
I'm glad you said that. Well, <laughs> the, bigger, the bigger mission is to, to serve the public, but on an ad hoc basis, you have a budget, and with all due respect to my boss here, the budget is awfully tight, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of wiggle room in the middle of a year if somebody has an idea. That's one of my great frustrations. It's a hard climate in which to have a good idea in the middle of a fiscal year, because there's very little, very little wiggle room. Right. right. Okay. We, maybe we'll keep this up here. I mean, for this is, you know, and I, not to belabor, but the, the issue of collaboration, it sounds great. Partnerships are wonderful. Um, and we've, Spotlight's been very fortunate that virtually all of them have worked well. But mm -hmm. it is, we each have our own way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 I wouldn't say necessarily tension, but it, it certainly, it adds a layer of, uh, of excitement to uh, any joint project. <laughs> yeah, but I just add on that. Uh, Newsworks probably has more than 25 active partnerships right now. Mm -hmm. Actually managing those would logically be a job in and of itself. I mean, every partners, every news organization has slightly different cultures, slightly different workflow mm -hmm. and habits, and you can really run afoul of that if you don't pay attention. And, and I would just jump in and say, and you should all be hiring for that position. Yeah. <laughs> can I add something? Yeah. Uh, I think it, it helps when, when uh, news organizations from different media work together because there's there's so many ways that we can work with NJ Spotlight and do at WNYC. There are times when we can just invite John or, or uh, another one of his journalists uh, onto the radio and talk and, and it's, it's pretty clearly identified that this is NJ Spotlight and uh, the, the uh, listener, the audience on the web can, can judge uh, the, the, the content based on based on what they see the, the we also work and have worked together on reporting projects and then you're working in in the room together and you're building trust and you're uh, you're, you're as, as Chris said you're, you're working with people whose values uh, you share there are other times um, the the credo in our newsroom and it's 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 the consequence of budgets being tight and staffs being small is we always ask ourselves, how can we add value? Sometimes you add value, and I, I'm, Jeff Jarvis is looking at me, by, <laughs> by aggregating. And um, is there a way that you've put that from time to time, do what you do best, and, and link to the rest? And it's, it's, I can't believe I said it out loud. Uh, but it's, it's, it's yeah, but it, 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 it works. Uh, they, we have the virtue of having sophisticated audiences that mm -hmm. can discern what's what's uh, what we've added value to and what we've mm -hmm. just shared. And mm -hmm. this, we live in a culture of sharing. Okay. Can I add uh, one more point to right. this? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, but, but and I certainly agree with that. And and um, and I've talked to Jeff about it as well. I think what is very important, though, in this new um, system, is is original reporting too, um, and and really bringing something new to it, mm -hmm. and, and not. I think aggregation is great, and I think it does. But but what's important, and, and I think sets you apart, and it has helped us, is is that we are bringing stuff that nobody else is doing, and I think that's critical to to um, to these collaborations working. I think Susan Haig from the Arts News Network has done that, brought something that nobody else has brought um, into the picture. Uh, Can yes, I just, I'd like to make one more point too, which is just that um, I think there's a real opportunity to be more inclusive mm -hmm. in our news mm -hmm. in the in the the communities yeah. that we cover, mm -hmm. which I think we mm -hmm. do not such a great job at right now. Okay. Well, let's hear about whatever this job is <laughs> and turn to uh, to Chris Anderson. And this is to be continued, folks, uh, and, and Kathleen McCullough. And tell us a little bit about what you're doing. And if you found out anything that you think would be useful in um, about seven minutes, that would be great. <laughs> so just to introduce, um, this has become kind of a, we were asked by the NJ News Commons um, to sort of look at the state of the New Jersey media ecosystem. Um, this has become a multi-part research project. We are doing, uh, we have done a brief content analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done a series of qualitative interviews with a lot of the journalists and newsmakers in the state of New Jersey talking about what is actually going on. Uh, we are putting together an actual digital geo map that can be added to and subtracted from um, as necessary that actually maps all of these news outlets. Mm -hmm. uh, we are creating a network map, a social media network map, which basically looks at who's linking to who in the New Jersey media ecosystem. Uh, and we have several other projects. Um, 
uh, Katie McCullough of uh, Rutgers, uh, a graduate student at Rutgers, has sort of taken the lead on the content analysis and mm -hmm. the qualitative research. So, you know, I want to just turn it over to her and let her talk about what, what she's found. Okay. okay, great. Thanks. First of all, this has just been enormously helpful um, for us so far. So, thank you for allowing us to participate. <laughs> And um, it seems like this research work is really needed. <laughs> so that's, you know, heartwarming to hear. So first of all, um, in order to improve New Jersey news system in a more sustainable way, we feel that it's really important to actually understand what the current system is. So with that in mind, our project is sort of honing in on what remains in the New Jersey system, what is emerging, and where the opportunities lie for New Jersey news. So those are sort of the three of our points. And as Chris um, stated, we, we're kind of drawing on and extending um, work that's been done on news ecology in Philly, also work that's been done in Baltimore and the North Carolina Research Triangle. And we started with two phases as kind of the preliminary reporting that's coming back today. And the first was a content analysis of um, public affairs news in the Star Ledger for August of 2009 and 2012. Um, looking at number of articles and also column length in inches. And the second sort of half of the reporting is actually in-depth interviews um, uh, with journalists from across the state and wide array of mediums and formats. Um, asking kind of who is reporting the news, what news is actually being covered, and in what ways is this coverage changing? So those are kind of the driving questions. So as we began this research, it became clear right, that the current ecosystem lies on a historic groundwork, what we might want to think of as the infrastructure for New Jersey news, and in particular, that New Jersey actually um, has a long history of having fragmented news coverage. And this kind of comes from what I'm going to highlight is two key critical parts of the New Jersey ecosystem that may appear obvious to us all, but are really undergirding some of the issues facing New Jersey news. And the first is, right, the slip between New Jersey, New York, and Philadelphia markets. The second is, is that we have over a century of an extreme case of home rule, the home rule mentality and home rule government, right, which has um, sparked, you know, over 566 different municipalities. And what this translates into is building more boundaries in civic identification and, um, it's also, where do we draw the label of who is us and who is them? And so it's just kind of creating more boundaries between who is us and who is them. That sort of makes it a more challenging context for aggregate news coverage. Also, um, it demands greater reporter resources. As was brought up earlier, there's lots of space for stuff to happen. I thought that was a great way to put it. <laughs> um, and it does happen, right? So it's a kind of extending the resources even more. Um, I'm going to skip over the detail for time. Okay. <laughs> So there's fewer journalists covering larger areas, right, with less time. So this has a lasting impact on what's getting reported and how it's getting reported. So what's reported are stories that are able to maintain reader interest, but then involve less in-depth reporting. Um, that basically, there's less coverage that's of what's being reported. So it's as. Um, as a quote from one of my interviews stated, it's no longer an issue of whether a story is being covered. The question is, is it being covered and followed, right? So in the article on Reloading the State House, um, Mark points to the loss of stories when politicians aren't cataclysmically <laughs> clashing, right? So what we're actually losing is less comprehensive coverage. So there's fewer follow-up stories. Um, so I was very heartened, for instance, to hear about sustained coverage of Sandy versus going losing that coverage and moving on to the next story. Or the, in, um, another thing that we're losing, right, is alternate voices. So we're losing the number of voices that we're hearing, and that, that's definitely a big problem. And also the context for why we should care. And this is really, really hugely important. So, for instance, with the Trenton baseball, what's really important is well, why do I care? <laughs> why should I care about the specific inning or the specific hit? So it is in providing that framing of the context um, that, that adds, adds that value. And that is what is starting to be missing from the ecosystem. So in our content analysis, the 2009 versus 2012, looking again at public affairs reporting, 
Um, we saw streamlined coverage. So there actually, I've, we found that the state house reporting was sustained, but that softer news, or as we were debating a little bit earlier, there's a loss in the civic cultural news coverage. Um, and there were fewer voices. There's, because there is this loss in this civic cultural coverage, we're, we've lost columnists, for instance. I no longer can read my gardening col column, for instance, which I miss. Things like that are missing. And 2012 overall had 18% less number of stories. So there are less voices actually like f coming from different segments, even within that one news source, not even within the overall ecosystem. There was also a disproportionate coverage of certain stories. In 2009, it was, I, I noted, Cash for Clunkers was very popular and was also very popular on the front page for the Star Ledger. And the front page is a very important right, site for sharing of, of very important issues in the state. In 2012, it was even more dramatic. Keep in mind, I'm looking at August. So Chris Christie and the Republican National Convention was 6% of public affairs news that was reported on the front page of the Star Ledger. And even more dramatically, 15 of the 35 articles were on the front page, which again is this critical space of shared space for important issues. Overall, as we kind of heard earlier, what's um, changing is this decline in shared space, that um, we no longer have everyone sitting around that hearth listening to the radio, or no one, all, we're not all watching the three same network news channels. Um, and what this really trans in, translates into is less sharing and discussion of news, which is what is giving the news its value. So um, as we have, uh, as news is trans becoming more online, right, everyone has a web page. Everyone's linking to a web page. I'm not just exaggerating. Everyone also has a web page. Um, with this convergence, it makes it less productive to think in terms of different mediums, so to think in terms of newspapers, radio, and TV as separate spaces. And it's kind of, we're, we're saying it's more productive to just think of what geographical space and what news is being covered where, and maybe what stories are missing versus in terms of medium. Uh, there's this decline in shared space indicates that maybe a general or centralized news hub um, would not, is not possible or would not be sustainable, right? So that we, we kind of um, want to rethink the models for what we're looking into. And actually, Ellen's, um, the layered model of news that looks at news more in terms of how it functions, which looks at connection, curation, and creation. There's too many Cs, it gets very confusing. Mm -hmm. So it's connection, curation, and connect, connection, creation, curation. <laughs> right? Thinking of the news less in terms of uh, this is television, this is radio, but thinking in terms of these layers is a sort of a more productive way, and it shifts the focus into network flows, how news is flowing within the system, and away from these div platform divisions, which, as I started off with, you know, New Jersey has a lot of different boundaries and divisions within how the news gets covered. So the more we can do away with those, the better off we are. Um, so in kind of Overall, what we yeah. found kind of thing is this decline in the constancy or the follow through of stories that offer the context for why readers should care, and this decline in the shared space of stories. So we recommend shifting concern from kind of what news is being covered and more in terms of the ways that the news is being shared. So sort of building these connections, what stories do need to be curated, sort of Debbie's newsletter in a way. Um, but more or less about um, a general news hub and more around issues, because issues are those platforms that call public into being, which is a quote from a, and so we need to be sure that we're identifying key issues and, or issues that aren't being covered, right, and that we curate and connect via kind of more issue-focused news hubs, so that's where we see hope. And, okay. and I just wanted to, to state overall that um, in, in doing this research and talking to everyone, that I really wanted to highlight how deeply New Jersey citizens still care about their communities and the issues that impact them, and that that's our greatest resource. And that's still there and very much exists. Thank you very much for giving us this preview. 
and giving us something to think about as we think about what we do next. So well, thank you uh, that's for great. Us be yeah. Here. Um, I'd now like to turn to you, and uh, this is your chance. This is like a focus group. What do you think we need to focus on? And what would you like to see? Does anybody, do we have about five or six people who want to throw something out? Yes, Donna? Um, well, first of all, I find it stunning, Kathleen, that you should Please say. Uh, I, I find it stunning, <laughs> stunning that you should say that there uh, are fewer voices when, in fact, now anybody can publish. So I'm not really sure what the disconnect is there. Mm -hmm. um, but to move over to what John is doing, if the answer to more voices is collaboration, then my follow-up question is, is collaboration a sustainable business model? So do the news directors, if the people you partner with, if you paid them, uh, you know, whatever market value is for the news that they produce, would you still be able to maintain as many partnerships as you have? And then for people like John, um, if your, does, does your collaboration pay to sustain your operation? So jumping in on the question of, you know, how is that, what is that paradox, right? How is it possible to say there are simultaneously fewer voices and so many more people are able to publish and, you know, there are so many more news outlets out there doing publishing? The answer is, that that diversity of voices that is found in the larger media ecosystem is not present in the central media institutions that produce the majority of the news content in the state of New Jersey, right? The content that is being produced by those central news organizations, because it is being produced more quickly and because it is being produced with fewer resources, does not in any way incorporate that diversity of that news ecosystem into their coverage. Right, so you have both things going on simultaneously. You have a fragmentation and an explosion of coverage and voices, but you have a decline in diversity, both of issues covered in terms of who gets in the news within the central news organizations in New Jersey, in Philadelphia, in the Research Triangle in California, in, you know, in a lot of places. So, you know, that's sort of a paradox you have to keep. You have to keep both those things in your mind. Both those things are true. There is simultaneously more and less. Okay. Somebody else. Yes. Yes, Gary Gelman. Is there a place in New Jersey, whether it be online or on a radio station, whereby if I have an hour commute to work, I can turn it on and just hear the news read to me from any one of your publications without uh, major commercials or with limited or no commercials? And is there a need? Well, in, in terms of does it exist now, um, not on NJ Spotlight, um, but, <laughs> but I will say, I mean, I think NYC and HYY would be the closest uh, with what they're doing. Um, I'm talking New Jersey specifically. No, but they, no, I mean, they're, they're both have fairly large New Jersey functions at this point, and I think, in, and um, we're, I mean, one idea is even a 20-minute podcast. Everyone says the, the ideal podcast is 20 minutes because that's the average uh, commute. Um, and I think, I mean, I think that it's, it's a valid question. I think it's, um, th there are ways to do it where you can do it as a weekly thing. Um, again, it, you know, it, the, the production quality matters on something like that. You don't want to just be sitting there listening to somebody drone on. Um, mixing it with interviews, having some different perspectives, I think, is, is valuable. But I think, you know, there's, there's certainly a value for it. I think, you know, this is a question that Donna touched on, um, you know, the, the big S in, in online news, sustainability. Um, is it something you could sell? Um, and I'll admit, this is some, you know, when you were asking me what was I thinking uh, three years ago, I, um, that has certainly become something I'm thinking about now is the sustainability of this. And collaboration alone, um, and now we're sort of segueing to Donna's question, but co collaboration alone is not necessarily a great money maker in itself. I think it certainly you have partnerships where you're, um, where you're, you know, you, you're paying each other uh, to to use the content. I think any success in this so far is is proven that it's got to be a diverse revenue stream. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it that you need revenue, you need sponsorships. I think events, webinars, any which way, and, and certainly shared content uh, is, is another way of doing that as I, well. I think, though, that one of the things that has happened is that there is more predictability about where you can get New Jersey news. Uh, you know that you, at 6 o'clock you can get news on, on TV. 
you might not know that you could hear the same news at 7.30 on NJPR, but you can at the top of the news, at the top of the hour, get something about New Jersey from, N, uh, from uh, New Jersey Public Radio. You can get something about New Jersey on Newsworks, and I know people tell me they listen at 6 o'clock because they know they might get something from New Jersey, and they like what they hear. Uh, so we have not had that kind of predictability in New Jersey, and we probably should have more. We don't have a time when you can hear a New Jersey version of Terry Gross. Uh, uh, but I, I think we're, if you had a wish of what you wanted, it would be probably more of that, that um, you, you would know where you could hear about New Jersey or look at what you want to do about New Jersey and not necessarily go online, but it's good to know that you could go online. So, um, I, I, yes, you Tris? Know, I just wanted to make a point to this question. At, um, at one point, we gathered a number of our partners. I think NJ Spotlight was in the room represented by Lee on a conference call, but um, to talk about the idea of creating a joint membership. Um, because we were an organization with the infrastructure and the knowledge of how to basically support ourselves largely through memberships. I think there were six or seven partners in the room. I thought this was a great idea. I was kind of evangelical about it. And we talked for two hours, and everybody said, it's an interesting idea, but everybody was in a slightly different place. And I will say there was one, the ego of one person in the room is he thought he should be in charge of the membership, and that was a big problem. <laughs> but you know, we were basically saying, we will offer you our membership e e infrastructure. We will offer you all the member benefits that we've already generated. And you can either create a membership jointly with us and we'll take a fee for running it, or if you already have a membership program, you can do this as an upsell, you know, sort of an added value to your members. And um, we talked about it for six months and nothing happened. I mean, these things are just really, really hard to monetize. You know, I will also say too, you know, collaboration is not necessarily a money maker, but it can be a money saver, but only if it's done well. Um, and the difference between collaboration done well and collaboration done badly is something that, once again, I think we you know, need a lot more research on. Um, um, the JLab folks uh, down at uh, American University did a great sort of pilot project on, on sort of fostering, measuring, and discussing what news collaborations are successful and what news collaborations fail. Um, what makes a successful collaboration and, and what you know can can limit it? Mm -hmm. um, I think we need more research like that. We need more. Um, we need more of an understanding of. You know, I, I think it's good that we're all at the point where we can say we want to collaborate, um, and I think it's time to kind of take that to the next step and say what makes a good collaboration that can save us money, or allow us at least to focus our limited resources in new ways. And what is simply going to create another layer of red tape and bureaucracy and confusion and you know sort of not necessarily handling that collaboration in the right way? Uh, yes, Mark. Mark Pfeiffer. Um, going back to the 565 municipalities right. yes. in Jersey yes. now. Um, <laughs> yes. One of the one of the one of the areas that right, that is very uh, that we don't oh, yeah. talk a lot is in old media, which is weekly newspapers. Mm -hmm. And weekly newspapers are were traditionally the way a lot of folks found out what was going on in those home rule situations. And I'm curious if any of the of the panelists have looked at the issue of weeklies, their economics, and the way they've tried to move on in, into the into the, the web world with their own websites and trying to bridge that gap. We talked a lot about the, the dailies, but I haven't heard any discussion on the weeklies. Um, from my preliminary, what I've seen so far in, in talking to people who work in weeklies, um, one of the things that's really great about the weeklies is that I would say the weeklies are one of the spaces where there is still the shared space and it comes through the free distribution, the three free printed distribution. Mm -hmm. So if you're a weekly that has, um, you know, a community paper that has free distribution in, you know, particular communities, then that is kind of building in that shared space, that shared community. So the, the issues of driving traffic to your hyperlocal site, for instance, and things like that aren't as much an issue for, for the weeklies. And we see that because the weeklies are being sustained, the weeklies are still alive. Whereas a daily You're making money, <laughs> a daily pay, a daily is going away. The weekly is still there, and I really think that's driven by the distribution and circulation. I wasn't so much referring to the free weeklies because those are very big mm -hmm. on their on their news content and their news hall. The, the paid weeklies, though, I think I'm curious what you've seen on that side. 
Mark, I think yeah. we can call on you. Yeah. I thought George White from the New Jersey <laughs> Press Association was here, but I guess he's not. Wait a minute, let's give... No, give your mic. I'm Mark Magger. I'm here as a uh, uh, corporate uh, spouse in, uh, <laughs> in uh, this role. My wife runs the uh, largest uh, 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 weekly chain. Um, it, uh, uh, weekly chain of the state. Weeklies have maintained their uh, circulation. They have uh, they have not had the uh, drops that these uh, that uh, newspapers like uh, again and the uh, Star Ledger have had of uh, of a uh, of a uh, forty uh, percent in uh, circulation. Uh, but they've uh, uh, suffered from the uh, from the uh, same uh, uh, from the uh, same de uh, from the uh, same decline of uh, retail uh, of uh, of a retail advertising base. So uh, 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 they are con uh, continually very strapped. Uh, they're uh, cutting staff, not quite at the levels of the uh, dailies, but uh, uh, but uh, still less, uh, uh, still less substantially, and they're uh, and they're uh, struggling. Uh, they are uh, surviving better, but uh, they're still uh, struggling. And uh, and the uh, uh, trans uh, the uh, trans uh, the uh, trans uh, uh, position of the web. Um, uh, uh, they're like well, on the web, but the uh, web uh, does not produce any uh, revenue for the uh, weeklies anymore than it does for the uh, 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 dailies in uh, uh, terms of being able to maintain a uh, in uh, terms of being able to maintain a, 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 a maintain a maintain a maintain a reporting there's a, a reporting core. I, mean, I think there's also been a real um, dilemma for the weeklies and how their weekly news cycle made that transition to the web. Um, you know, there there was, um, I think, a, a a learning a steeper learning curve um, at the weekly, which is you know more used to long form writing, um, you know, long stories that have long shelf life, long production time. Um, I think that they have finally figured it out. Um, you know, I think that. That they are they are finding that that combination of you know more web friendly content in terms of rapid updates and speed and long form writing, um, but I do think that um, in the dark ages of you know digital news online, uh, they had a steeper learning curve than than um, dailies or certainly than than TV news, which ironically enough you know in some ways shares bio rhythms the most with the web. I, 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 the challenges that uh, challenges the uh, challenges that uh, weekly staffs have like uh, weekly staffs have like had to learn that uh, there are now uh, dailies. Yeah, okay. uh, you're now up. Uh, uh, you're now up up uh, uh, publishing and you're like updating on an hourly basis yeah. on your website uh, without a uh, uh, without a uh, daily size staff. You know, I think the news directors would be good at telling us how long a program should be, and maybe ours is long enough, and we should come to a close. And I'd like to have Ellen Goodman come up, a great partner. Thank you for all you're doing and for the country in the work with the Ford Foundation that you've been doing and sharing that with uh, your, your insight and information with us in New Jersey. And what do you make of today? Do you have some closing words before we call on Jeff? Well, one of my closing words should have been one of my opening words, which is that um, if you want to tweet about this, it's hashtag NJ oh, Pub Media. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, and we are we are at Ripple R I I P L. Um, you know, I, I thought I might be able to sum up this uh, this session, but um, I, I think that's a hopeless task. I'll just say that, you know, I think we've heard a couple of research ideas. So we have um, uh, at least the social science researchers. Um, I haven't heard any legal research ideas, but um, have their marching orders. Um, and then I think some of the themes have been, uh, obviously, the, the commons as a hub and what a hub means and the um, Jeff's um, a charge that what we really need to do, we, hub, the hub will be judged by whether or not we create more outlets. Um, another theme was hiring more journalists, um, that's the end game. Um, civic engagement, both as a financial imperative as well as a mission imperative. Um, the really interesting, the government 2.0 point uh, and, and um, civic and innovation tools. Um, the marketing and driving traffic uh, point. Um, audience development, membership development. Um, 
those were the major themes that I heard. Um, Jeff. You're, you're on for Jeff, Jeff, since words. Jeff has been in, in uh, this from the beginning, we've asked him to be at the end of this, but then yeah. to look to the future. Right. Uh, you said that I should uh, bring a uh, benediction. That's right. Uh, my sister is a Presbyterian minister in Chestnut Hill, uh, Pennsylvania, so I should start doing this from a robe. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I'm excited to be here because, because I, I, I got involved with this because I'm Chris Daggett's neighbor. And uh, as I would uh, uh, air quote run down the street, uh, we'd get to, into long conversations about, about the state of media in New Jersey, then had the privilege to work with Molly and Chris and, and uh, David and um, uh, I'll stop there. But uh, all the folks who, uh, Feather and such, who worked on the first meeting two years ago. So I think that the perspective that I have, having been able to witness this for two years now, uh, and Hans, um, is, uh, is an incredible amount of progress. And the, the, the fact that, that you folks here at Rutgers have brought this room together twice is really important, and I would uh, hope that you're going to keep doing it on at least an annual basis. Um, and and um, I think it's really important work, and I think it's really right. And I think that the opportunity, I get, people got mad at me when I said it this way at that first meeting, but I'll say it again anyway. I think we have the opportunity in New Jersey with a blank slate of media. Now, those who are already here say it's not a blank slate. It's got chalk on it, but fine. We can treat it as a blank slate. We can reinvent things. We have this great opportunity here to go from worst to first, not only in laws about corruption, but also in the coverage of it. And I think that that's, that's the great opportunity here. So I've heard a lot around the room, and I, but I won't even try to summarize better than Ellen did. But I would suggest, yes, that we go forward now with a lot of high goals. And I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. The first is that I think the way to deal with diversity and voices is to get more people making media in the state and help them do that. And the commons, the New Jersey News Commons, which I had the privilege to be around, was created to do, I always summarize it in four things. First is training. Training people in media, in journalism, and very importantly, in business. We've got to create an atmosphere where so many unemployed journalists at the ledger or so many people who care about their 565 towns, thank you, Princeton, um, and Princeton Borough, the formerly known as, the artist formerly known as Princeton Borough. Um, congratulations, Princeton. Yeah, congratulations, Princeton. Uh, and and my, my kids take tennis from the, one of the people who runs that whole thing, so it's, uh, it matters. So, so thank you, Gina, too. Um, uh, that we have all of these towns and all of these representatives and all of these communities, and we don't have nearly enough voices in them. I think, Donna, you're right. We have the, the paradox here that we have more voices in one sense, but I would say we don't have nearly enough, A, and B, they're not heard in the right places. So first is training. Second is what Debbie's doing in uh, that newsletter, which also NJ.com, where full disclosure I consult, is going to run it every day on the homepage. So you get all those voices from all those places now on to NJ.com, so now you get more, more efforts there, which I think is going to be very, very important to distribute. The other thing Debbie has done, which I'm very proud to have been associated with, is the work she's done with Repost.us. And I want to give just a second on this. Repost.us makes articles embeddable the way YouTube videos have been embeddable. Duh. Why didn't we think of this years ago? If an article could travel around with brand, revenue, analytics, and links attached to it, then fly, children, fly. We'd send our articles all around. So what I want to see happen is that a Spotlight article can appear on NJ.com with financial benefit to Spotlight and on Baristanet with financial benefit to Spotlight, and a Baristanet article can appear elsewhere, and so on and so on. And Debbie has set up the structure. We only have NJ.com and about three blogs into it. That's why NJ.com has become the big elephant in the room that you saw. But we want a lot more people starting up and a lot more involved in this, and that's a way to get this stuff distributed around the state. So that's two, is curation distribution. The third is collaboration. A lot of mention of that today. I absolutely agree with Chris that collaboration is about efficiency, but it's also about doing the things together we can't do alone. Yeah. So let's determine from an outcomes basis. That's why I went to that other research desire of mine. Where are the outcomes we need to accomplish to have an informed uh, citizenry in the state? Start from there and then back up and say, what can we now say that we can do together that Spotlight couldn't do alone, HYY and, and, and uh, WNYC couldn't do alone, the Ledger couldn't do alone, 10 bloggers couldn't do alone, but together, my God, look what they can do. The fourth thing is that the, uh, the Commons hopes to provide services, such as, for example, we haven't looked into this yet, but things like libel insurance and health insurance. That would be a great mitzvah to this world, because if we can now take a journalist 
who says, you know, I would cover, uh, one, one thing I want to see out of the great work that, that's coming out of Knight Foundation with Dodge and company on the um, uh, Sandy Grant, my personal dream, I'll put a plug for this, my personal dream is that somebody comes along, a journalist comes along and says, you know what, I want to devote myself to covering the recovery full time for the next three years. And this grant will let me do that. And NJ.com and every blog and spotlight can, can, can promote this stuff and push this stuff. And that we can provide the way to give that person maybe some health insurance while they're doing it. And maybe some libel insurance for when they say nasty things about the nasty people who are doing nasty things out of the recovery. We can be guaranteed because it's New Jersey. Right? So uh, training, services, distribution, and, and, and uh, collaboration. Those are the things that were the mission of the cooperative that came out of that first meeting two years ago. It's not just the cooperative doing it. They're there to support this. They're a support organization. That's where we go ahead. So I would say we've got to go forward with high goals for a lot more outlets in the ecosystem, covering a lot more of these towns and interests and a lot more of these communities from a lot different perspectives than even we see in this room. And we've got to have some research to say, are we really accomplishing something in this state, for the state, for its citizens, uh, and measure whether or not we can make New Jersey, for the first time, a leader in local media. Go in peace. <laughs> And thank you, thank you to every single news person who was here today because they're doing it and we're receiving it and we're grateful and we do need to do better. We're not there yet and so thank you for being in the room with us. Thank you, Ellen, for being such a great partner and uh, thank you to all of you.